for spending morning with us. Uh, we're very, very excited to be with you. And before I introduce uh, uh, Jonathan and myself, I just want to say uh, thank you and also I'll tell you why we're doing this. Um, this is a, an annual night now, bladder cancer and urinary tract cancer educational event for patients and their loved ones. And the goal here is to disseminate information, share knowledge about where we are, the current state of uh, this uh, cancer, as well as where we go in the future, the future direction and answer questions. And we have a, a gamut of amazing speakers today. We're very, very happy for the lineup of all the great speakers uh, addressing different parts of patient care. And the reason, of course, for this event uh, is the patient uh, and, of course, the family. Uh, next slide, Ritu, thank you. So uh, uh, I, I would like to start by saying I'm very, very blessed to work with, with Dr. Wright and uh, uh, we're together co-hosting this. Uh, now, Dr. Wright is uh, a professor of urology. He is a Paul Lance and Down professor. And he's also the director of Urolo urology at the University of Washington Medical Center. Uh, he's doing a lot of work in the field, huge contributions. And I'm uh, uh, Petrus Grivas. I'm uh, serving as the clinical director of the medical oncology program in the Gen Urinary Cancers program. And I'm a social professor here at the University of Washington. And we both have a position at Fred Hatz. Uh, and before I pass the microphone to Jonathan, I would like to very uh, briefly thank all of you again for joining our, all our speakers for uh, uh, being uh, willing uh, to participate in this educational event. Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, Ritu has done a wonderful uh, work um, along with the SCCA team. Uh, Beacon, Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network, and Stephanie Stiso is here, and she will talk to you in a few minutes, as well as the Howard Cohen Foundation. And I will give the microphone to Jonathan to take us to some housekeeping items and introduce Howard. Thanks so much. Thanks, Petros, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, we have up here just our agenda. It's a pretty packed agenda. We're gonna try and get this all done uh, by noon. We've broken it up with some epidemiolo epidemiology aspects and then starting with earlier stage disease, moving through higher stage disease and talking about research and also uh, some specific patient support issues as well too. So uh, these, this is being recorded as I think many of you heard when we were starting a couple of minutes ago. Uh, you are all muted so and unable to mute. So please post your questions using the chat function. And then Dr. Grievous and I will be uh, working through that. When we have time after talks, we'll do them uh, out loud. Otherwise, we will just uh, type in the response as well. Uh, as you can see, if you accidentally uh, leave the, the webinar, you can certainly just uh, re-click the link and it will take you right back to it. And at the end, please fill out the event feedback form. It's really helpful for us. We make, some, we make changes from year to year based on that feedback for, for what type of topics you all would like to hear. So, so please uh, fill that out for us. It's very helpful. One of the things that is great for us uh, in this is building relationships uh, friendships with our friends and with our patients and their families. So, and I'm going to introduce now Howard Cohen, who certainly fits that bill. He has really been uh, a team member over the past, I, I don't know, Howard, is it seven, eight years now, uh, uh, helping us in the infancy of establishing our bladder cancer program, supporting us in education, supporting us in research. Uh, and a lot of what we've become today has done, been done with Howard. So, uh, Howard, I want to turn it over to you to talk a little bit uh, about uh, your experience and, and just thanks so much for being with us today, Howard. You're still muted, Howard. Okay, now you can hear me. Perfect. Okay, well, good morning. And uh, thank you for inviting me to speak to you this morning about bladder cancer. I'm an eight and a half year can bladder cancer survivor with no recurrences since my uh, initial diagnosis. I've always lived my life as a firm believer of a paraphrase Robert F. Kennedy saying, most people look alive and ask why, why, while I look alive and ask why not. Once I went through the initial process to remove the tumor in my bladder, which was caught early and did not get through the wall, my partner Gino and I started the Howard J. Cohen Bladder Cancer Foundation in September of 2014. Usually foundations are named after people who have passed, but I tricked them all and stayed around, thanks to Dr. Wright and all of his amazing staff. 
there were three pillars to the foundation. One, bring awareness to bladder cancer with its causes and symptoms. Two, profess a healthy lifestyle, including the benefits of a strict plant-based diet. And three, raise much needed monies for bladder cancer research for the University of Washington Bladder Cancer Research Team. To date, we have raised and donated to the UW Bladder Cancer Research Team $151,000 raised through golf tournaments, bowling events, socials, and letter writing campaigns. These monies were put to amazing use by the researchers and was the catalyst, from what I understand, for earning its first ever National Institute of Health grant, totaling $900,000, bringing our involvement to over a million dollars since 2014. I recently heard a very appropriate concept which applies to our work. Hope does not create action. Action creates hope. Let us join together for whatever disease we come in contact to, to breathe in suffering and breathe out compassion. Stay tuned for our upcoming fundraising events. For further information, please go online, very simple uh, website, bladdercancerfoundation.com. Uh, we plan to have a um, golf tournament this summer. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't had it for the last two years due to COVID. Uh, this year, again, has a little bit of a, of a tweak to it. Uh, I've uh, been changed, I had to change jobs due to the impact of the uh, COVID on the industry. And so I'm actually working out of town for the next six months in Portland. So I don't know about the uh, access to have a golf tournament, but we're trying. But whatever you do, uh, please uh, consider donating and raising money in your own way to help build new and great bladder cancer research tools. So thank you for inviting me and I uh, welcome any questions. Uh, I don't have a slide here with my email address, but my current email address, if anybody wants to reach me is uh, all lowercase hcdg2122 uh, at outlook.com. And uh, I'll make sure Jonathan and Petros have my contact information. But Whatever I can do to help uh, build more research dollars to, to make bladder cancer uh, treatment uh, coming into the new age is whatever I can do to help. So thank you. Thank you, Howard. It's been awesome. Uh, you can put your, e maybe put your email in the chat so people can grab it off you of bet. that too. That'd be a, a something you could do. So, um, so with that, I'm gonna, we're gonna start on our topics. We're gonna start out with uh, something we all are interested in is risk factors for bladder cancer. And giving this talk is Dr. Peter Kirk. Dr. Kirk is a urology resident here at the University of Washington. Uh, and he is doing, taking a year and doing research this year. So blending his both clinical and research work. And I will go ahead and give it, give it away to Dr. Kirk. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Wright. Up here. Able to see my slides okay? Perfect. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, as Dr. Wright said, my name is Peter Kirk. I'm a current fourth year resident physician in the Department of Urology, University of Washington. And I'm actually taking a year to work with Dr. Wright, trying to, to better understand environmental risk factors for bladder cancer. And so this is kind of an exciting opportunity today for me to share some of the work that we're doing with you and talk about other sort of more well-established risk factors for bladder cancer. So here's the, the 10,000 foot overview of, of bladder cancer rates across the world. Darker blue here represents increased rates of bladder cancer diagnosis. And you can see that bladder cancer is more frequently diagnosed in North America and Western Europe with decreased rates down as we approach the equator and increasing a little bit as we continue south from there. Within the United States specifically, bladder cancer is the sixth most common cancer diagnosed and the 10th most common cause of cancer-related death with over 80,000 new cases diagnosed in 2019. We know that bladder cancer is a disease of aging 
and the average age at diagnosis is over 70. Over 90% of patients are over the age of 55 at the time of diagnosis. So fairly infrequently that we see bladder cancer in children or young patients, but it does happen occasionally. Here within the United States, we see sort of a, a similar pattern in the incidence rates in that in the northern latitudes, bladder cancer is more commonly diagnosed and those rates go down as we travel south with the highest rates being up in New England and then decreasing down through the south and the southwest. Bladder cancer is around four times more common in men compared to women and around twice as common in patients of white ethnicities compared to other groups with the lowest rates of bladder cancer being in Asian and Pacific Islanders. The number one most important risk factor for bladder cancer is tobacco smoking. Around 50% of bladder cancer deaths are related to tobacco use, and we know that smoking increases the risk of bladder cancer by two to 400%. There also appears to be at least some degree of a, a dose response relationship where more smoking can lead to more aggressive bladder cancer diagnosis. That risk is also not isolated to smokers, but can also be passed along to household contacts in the form of secondhand smoke, which also increases the risk for bladder cancer. Interestingly, that risk doesn't stop with smoking cessation, but can persist for years afterwards. And previous work by our group at the University of Washington and the Fred Hutchinson showed that for up to three decades after smoking cessation, much of that increased risk of bladder cancer is still there. The other important risk factor for bladder cancer is occupational exposures, which account for another 10 to 20% of bladder cancer cases. And these are related to chemicals, which I've listed here, benzene, aniline dyes, um, and so really any occupation that involves prolonged exposure to these chemicals can increase the risk of bladder cancer over the course of the patient's life, such as textile work, the cement industry, electric, electrical workers, hair dye workers. Um, there's actually some newer data coming out suggesting that firefighters may be at increased risk of developing bladder cancer. Um, as you can imagine, they're exposed to a number of chemicals through their work. Arsenic, which is a naturally occurring element, but is toxic to humans and can be found contaminating water supplies, over the longer term can lead to the risk of development of multiple malignancies, but bladder cancer is one of them. And so this is a map of Washington state showing measurement of arsenic levels in, in drinking water. And this is one area that our group currently at the University of Washington and Fred Hutchinson is, is working to explore. And so you can see here, this is a map of arsenic levels in drinking water across the state of Washington. Um, and each county here is pictured in red with the darker red representing higher levels of arsenic in the water. And then we've been able to link that with rates of new bladder cancer diagnoses and deaths from bladder cancer. And certainly you can see that there's some interesting geographic variation in how often we're diagnosing bladder cancer which seems to at least be somewhat related to the levels of arsenic in the water. So I, this is certainly an interesting area of ongoing research that we're working to better understand. Other risk factors for bladder cancer, really anything that increases levels of inflammation to the lining of the bladder over the long term, such as recurrent infections or chronic catheterization. Bladder augmentation, which is a procedure we do to expand the size of the bladder in some patients, can slightly increase the risk of bladder cancer in the long term. And then radiation treatment to other pelvic organs, such as the prostate or the cervix, can have a spillover effect on the bladder and increase the risk of developing bladder cancer many years down the line. There are also certain medications which have been tied to the development of bladder cancer. Cyclophosphamide, which is a chemotherapeutic, Phenacetin, which is an older pain medication, which has since been taken off the market, but was also shown to be related to the development of bladder cancer. And then some of the newer diabetes medications, there's at least a, a suggestion that there may be a signal for increasing the risk of bladder cancer for, for some of those medications, but it's, it's an area of, of ongoing research as we work to sort of understand the degree of that risk and, and better quantify it. Air pollution. Uh, this is the, the main focus of my research here, which I'll explain in a second, but 
These two images are from a, a recent publication from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And on the left, the areas in red are what the authors call bladder cancer hotspots or areas with higher rates of bladder cancer compared to the surrounding areas. And the authors were able to show that those hotspots overlap with areas of increased traffic density and exposure to hydrocarbons in the atmosphere. And there's been some conflicting data from different regions around the world about the degree to which air pollution is related to the development of bladder cancer. And so our main goal with my year is to develop a better understanding of this relationship by looking at cancer registries from across the United States and overlaying those with environmental protection agency data about ambient air pollution to, to really try and understand this relationship better and get a better understanding of, of the degree to which ambient air pollution can increase the risk for bladder cancer. This slide hits a little bit close to home for those of us living in Seattle this time of year, but UV exposure and vitamin D deficiency have also been related to the development of bladder cancer. And this makes sense if you think back to those maps we looked at a few slides ago in that the equatorial countries tend to have the lowest rates of bladder cancer diagnosis. And as, as you increase going in either direction, the rates of bladder cancer increase as well. And we can see here that you know, the, the base of the U here is right at the equator and then either direction, those rates go up. And this is a, another focus of my research here this year is, is trying to better understand this relationship within the United States because we also have nice data about the level of ultraviolet light exposure across the United States. And so we're, we're planning to link that data with bladder cancer incidents as well to try and get a, a better understanding of that relationship. So in conclusion, bladder cancer is a common malignancy. It's related to some things we can control and some things we can't. So it's, as we know, more common in older patients and differs across gender and race. But the most important factors related to the development of bladder cancer are smoking and occupational exposure. And I think we've done a, a good job in the last decades at decreasing both of those exposures and we're continuing to try to decrease them. In any one individual, it can be hard to know, you know what exactly caused bladder cancer. It's often a complex interplay of you know, all of these factors, things we can control, things we can't, possibly some genetic predisposition. Um, but better understanding and, and quantifying these risk factors is an exciting area of ongoing research that I think is going to continue to expand and help us to, to better avoid these things that are increasing the risk for bladder cancer. Thank you very much. A great talk, uh, Peter. Thank you so much for a very, very concise talk. Uh, uh, very important to note environmental factors, and of course, there's uh, potential genetic factors too that we start to understand more. Uh, so, genetic counseling may be another area of uh, interest in the recent days, uh, um, which actually we have a genetic counseling services here that we send patients to look for the genetic predisposition. Uh, and I think the interplay with the environmental factors is so nicely showed, and potential genetic predisposition may, may uh, uh, increase the risk. Peter, there's a question uh, um, by um, Alan, I think, in the uh, chat room. Any differences between cigarette and cigar smoking? How about frequency of smoking? Uh, is there any correlation there between the amount and frequency and the risk? Thank you, Peter. Yeah, thank you. That's an excellent question. I, I alluded to it a little bit, but there is at least some data that increasing the, the sort of smoking load, so to speak, is related with more aggressive types of bladder cancer or more aggressive bladder cancer diagnosis. Um, there's also data that would suggest that cigar and pipe smoking are also associated with bladder cancer, though I believe that risk is not to the same degree as cigarettes. Thank you, Peter. Maybe one very, very quick question, uh, the chicken and the egg question by Linda. Does vitamin D deficiency lead to bladder cancer or does bladder cancer cause vitamin D deficiency? Uh, and Linda says he knows there is a correlation, but which is first? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> That's a great question. That's an insightful, insightful comment. I mean, that's always the challenge with these sort of, you know, correlation studies where we're looking at the data and, you know, we, we unfortunately, I think with a question like this, can't randomize patients to, to either be, you know, not exposed to ultraviolet light or B vitamin D deficient. But I think from a mechanistic standpoint, it's easier to understand how lacking vitamin D could then 
you know, obviously it is related to antioxidants and that to me, I think potentially makes more sense as a, a pathway to explain the development of bladder cancer versus bladder cancer in turn causing vitamin D deficiency, if that makes sense. Thank you, Peter, and thank you so much for all the work you're doing. We're very, very happy to have you here, and thank you for your contributions. There is actually another question that I will let you, if you don't mind, uh, answer in the chat room by Kent regarding the healthcare system efficiencies to detect blood cancer prevalence. But in the interest of time, I may um, ask, ask you to answer it. And a question from David about military chemical exposure, Agent Orange. So I'll let you do that if you don't mind. And uh, thank you, sir. Appreciate you. And uh, in the meantime, we'll uh, introduce the next speaker. Uh, we're very excited to have Dr. Yao Niame. Uh, Dr. Niame is an assistant professor here at the Department of Urology. Uh, I know Dr. Niame from the Cleveland Clinic times when he was doing his residency there, uh, superstar in um, uh, research in gender urinary cancers with significant interest in uh, elimination of disparities and how do we achieve diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, Yao, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining. Petros and uh, Jonathan, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak this morning. Uh, I am using a new device, so if you can't hear me, please let me know and, and I can make a quick adjustment. Um, I am going to uh, go right into the talk because um, of that wonderful introduction. Uh, just some funding disclosures uh, that are supporting my research activities. So I always, um, a good place to start is on a definition for what health disparities or inequities may be. And I think a very simple way to think about this is differences in health uh, or health care between uh, populations. And, and so an easy way to think about that might be how do things differ for people based off of a variety of social factors um, like their race, uh, their income, or even uh, their, their sex or gender. Uh, in the case of bladder cancer, I think it's easy to look at that from a, a very high level and say, well, this is a disease that has a, a, a higher um, prevalence uh, or is more common in men uh, and in individuals who self-report as white. However, if you do a finer uh, sort of combing through of the de uh, data, which um, Dr. Kirk uh, demonstrated a, a bit in his talk, you can see that for bladder cancer, uh, for black individuals in the United States, that they're more likely to be diagnosed with more advanced disease, meaning that there is a delay potentially in their diagnosis uh, when they develop symptoms. Perhaps more telling is looking at survival rates. And so this is a study uh, from 2010 uh, that looked at uh, race and uh, sex. And it looked at survival for both early stage disease, which I, which I would think of as localized to the bladder and late stage disease, which would be metastatic uh, cancer or stage four cancers. And what you can see here is that in both settings, white males um, tend to do uh, better from a survival standpoint. In the early setting, we see that women, white women and black men have about the same uh, survival However, black women have, uh, or black females have uh, the lowest survival rates. Um, and in the late stage, we see that the disparity um, widens a little bit between white and black uh, male and females, but still overall, uh, there is a difference in survival purely based on race and sex. When we think about gender inequities in bladder cancer some more, we can think about this mortality incidence ratio. And I think in the interest of time, the easiest way to think about this is if the, the rate of death as a function of the number of, of bladder cancer cases was equal by, by gender or sex, this ratio would be one. And so anything above one suggests that women are more likely to die from bladder cancer as if, um, relative to the number of cases um, that we see annually. Um, and if it was below one, then that would say that men uh, are more likely to die from bladder cancer. And what we see here is worldwide, women are more likely to die from bladder cancer, um, especially in more developed countries um, and in nor the North American continent, and perhaps in less developed countries, one way to think about this is that both men and women do poorly. And so that incidence ratio is closer to one. 
So what explains inequities in bladder cancer? This is a model that we actually developed for prostate cancer uh, in some of the research that we're doing here um, at the uh, Fred Hutch and uh, University of Washington. But I think it applies to any cancer. And so uh, it's very easy to adapt this uh, in this setting. And I think when we think about the continuum of care for a cancer, you have the development of a cancer, that the cancer carcinogenesis, you have the development of symptoms, um, you have diagnosis, and then you have treatment, and then potentially progression, and potentially death from, from your cancer. And so when we think about disparities, I think there are three main categories that we need to think about that impact this uh, uh, progression from the development of your cancer all the way to, to, to a, a particular endpoint. And so we have structural factors. These are going to be things like systemic or structural racism, uh, laws and policies, economic systems that inform how individuals can interact around their health. These structural factors directly impact what we call social determinants of health. So these are things that very obviously influence the way in which we utilize health care. That's going to be your economic stability, your physical environment, your education, the community context in which you, you live and the support systems you may have, and the healthcare systems that are in your community. And then there are health factors um, that influence how we utilize healthcare. So these are going to be predisposing factors, your insurance, your education, income, your uh, additional diseases you may have, your cancer stage, um, and then access to doctors and specialists. So if we're talking about this disparity in bladder cancer, I think an example based off of some of the earlier data that I showed could be why do black women seem to have a much higher risk of dying from bladder cancer compared to everybody else? And in that setting, you can imagine um, structural components, right? We have um, policies and histories that lead to things like segregation uh, and environmental pollutants. And I think this is a very nice segue from Dr. Kirk's talk, but um, black individuals in the United States are much more likely to be exposed to air pollution. And a lot of that has to do with um, the, the areas in which um, uh, policies have forced some of those populations to live. And then if you think about social determinants of health, we can come up with a variety of scenarios um, that might influence um, how a black woman who might have something like blood in the urine might prioritize getting care or have access to care. And ultimately, uh, for women in general, when they present with blood in the urine, there is a higher likelihood that they may be diagnosed with UTI um, a urinary tract infection, or that the, that that presenting symptom uh, might be viewed as something gynecologic, and that can lead to a delay in their diagnosis. And so that's how all of these factors can work together to create a scenario in which symptom uh, recognition may be delayed, diagnosis may be delayed, and then ultimately access to care um, and treatment can be impacted by any one of these factors. So I wanted to just pull one example of some work that we've done here at the uh, at UW that reflects um, uh, an attempt to understand how uh, race um, or, or gender could impact um, treatment. So we all know that if you're diagnosed with muscle invasive bladder cancer, that the standard of care for those who are going to go to, to surgery is to get chemotherapy before surgery. Um, because there is high level evidence to support um, that treatment regimen as a survival benefit. Now, we did a few things. One, we wanted to know what were the patterns of people getting the right chemotherapy. And it's, I'm glad, we were all glad to see that there is definitely an increase in the use of standard of care therapy. And that's those dark blue bars over time um, as they've been adopted in the guidelines. And that's important because if you look at this graph here on the left, the rate of dying from bladder cancer is lowest in those who got the standard of care neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery. And in fact, those who got non-standard of care therapies, which would be um, non-cisplatin-based um, chemotherapy, were more likely to die. And, and therefore, in some ways, you could view this as, uh, as them being harmed. Interestingly, when we looked 
at this. Um, individuals who identified as Black or Hispanic um, or Latinx, um, those who had low socioeconomic status, and of course, those who had, were dysplatin ineligible were more likely to get this non-standard of care um, chemotherapy. And so we can see how race can influence uh, one's ability to get standard of care treatment. Now, I want to switch gears very quickly, again, in order to highlight some work that we've done, but also um, to uh, share some information that I think is really important um, to consider. This is an abstract from ASCO GU this year that looked at uh, reported self-reported uh, self race in clinical trials of bladder cancer. And I think if you look across the board, we see that the majority of studies actually don't report race. And among those that do, uh, the majority of the populations are comprised of white individuals. Um, and there's a reason for that. My very first slide demonstrated that this disease is more prevalent in white populations. But I think there is an opportunity for us to consider what the impact is of not having more inclusive clinical trials and studies. And this is true for some of our biologic specimen cohorts as well, which are informing precision oncology. Um, and we need to have some consideration for what it means um, to be uh, not as inclusive or as representative as we can be when we do these studies. So this is a unpublished um, study that we uh, have done here, looking at uh, data collected from several um, uh, institutional uh, biorepositories, looking at uh, somatic mutations, so uh, changes in the DNA um, within the tissue of, of bladder cancer specimens. And we, we want what we wanted to do is ask some very high-level questions not really diving into mechanism, but just trying to see if there are differences um, by race and sex. And the next three sets of slides, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on, but suffice it to say that we see that the number of mutations differs by sex and by race, uh, which is shown here in these uh, bar plots. Specific gene uh, which were identified as common genes from a larger study that was done in bladder cancer differ by sex and race. For example, we can see here this TP53 mutation uh, is more common in, um, in female patients here, and it's far more common in white individuals uh, in the repository. And then lastly, there's no difference in the actionable genes, which these are genes that might inform therapy, but certainly we saw differences um, in DNA repair genes, both by uh, sex and, and by race. The significance of this is that, um, as, as I pointed out in the very first slide, um, only 25% uh, of, uh, of this group uh, so was uh, self-reported as female and only 8% uh, reported as non-white, which is including all of the other ethnicities, um, not just black uh, individuals. And so if we think about, uh, in conclusion, I think there are a few things uh, that are important to think about in disparities. Number one, uh, there certainly are inequities by, by um, gender or sex and by race. Uh, and in, in, in the instance of black women, uh, or Black females, that, that is uh, compounded. They, there is an um, a inequity that reflects um, both structural and social determinants uh, of health uh, from each category for that group. Um, and inequities are driven by those three main categories that we highlighted, and that can inform things like biology, right? And certainly it's not just an issue of patterns of care, but exposures can certainly in, influence uh, biology. And so I think as we think about the research that we do, uh, we have to make more efforts to be inclusive, um, to help identify and mitigate factors that are driving inequities, and to make sure that all of the new um, innovation that we make in the space from a therapeutic standpoint, um, and as we drive further into this era of precision oncology, that we're including more people so that we get the answers right. Um, so with that, I want to thank again, Dr. Grievous and Dr. Wright um, for giving me this opportunity to present this morning, uh, and I'm happy to take some questions. Yeah, I mean, that was fantastic. Really great to see how 
both the needs from, from a biological side and research, but also the societal uh, responsibilities and needs too. So in the interest of time, I'll go ahead and just keep answering questions in the, in the chat and, and we'll move on to our next speaker. So thank you again, Dr. Niyami. Um, a question that commonly comes up in our clinics and even in emails, et cetera, is this concern over the BCG shortage that has definitely impacted the world uh, and even down to us locally here, uh, uh, not having access to BCG. And as a result, I've, uh, we're going to have a speaker today, Dr. Fed Ghali, who is uh, one of our colleagues in the Department of Urology here uh, clinically and also uh, is a Society of Urological Oncology fellow as well too. And he's gonna to speak to us today about uh, issues regarding the BCG shortage and what can be done. Great, thank you, Dr. Wright. Um, let me get my presentation loaded here. All right, um, like Dr. Wright mentioned, uh, I'm Fed Ghali and I'm very honored to speak with you all today about the BCG shortage and what some alternatives are. Um, I have no disclosures here. And just briefly, I'm gonna just discuss the history of how we found ourselves um, relying and using BCG uh, so frequently, what its current role is in bladder cancer uh, treatment very uh, uh, briefly, and then we'll discuss the shortage and what the response and some alternatives are. So some of the history of BCG, this is, um, this is one of uh, those sort of remarkable stories in, in medicine, at least to me, is it sort of begins with um, at the turn of the century in the early 1900s with really insightful clinical observations made um, here in the United States and in Europe about the, um, the occurrence of cancer in patients who have uh, survived a tuberculosis infection, which at the time was endemic throughout the Western world, as well as the rest of the world. And really key insights about people recognizing that folks who had tuberculosis and survived the infection tended to experience cancer at much lower rates. And this was corroborated in early autopsy studies. And then um, several reports, even looking at sort of population level studies, this is very early in sort of epidemiology as a field. Um, noting that in areas where tuberculosis was really high, cancer tended to decrease, and the and the inverse was also true. And so these are some of the early reports. And this was happening in parallel um, uh, with the sort of attempts to develop a vaccine to prevent tuberculosis, the the infection, the respiratory infection. And so this. Um, started with these two men, um, Dr. Kalmet and Dr. Guerin, who um, were microbiologists and working to develop a way to uh, vaccinate people and prevent tuberculosis. Again, this is very early in the understanding of uh, vaccine science. And they uh, presented <clears throat> this uh, BCG, which is uh, bacillus and then named after their initials um, as an early sort of form to try to prevent tuberculosis. But those, these two observations really didn't come together um, for another five decades or so um, to really come to this idea of using BCG as a part of cancer treatment. And in those five decades, again, there was sort of, uh, you know, sparse erratic observations about BCG and some tumor responses here and there. And then um, some observations in melanoma were really key to understanding this. But really it was the 1970s when uh, we first thought about using BCG as part of bladder cancer therapy. This is a, 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 an observation from, uh, from the group at UCLA, Dr. DeKernian at UCLA, who um, noted that a metastatic melanoma implant in the bladder uh, responded to injection into the tumor actually with BCG. And then um, very uh, quickly after uh, we had a seminal study by Dr. Morales, which looked at um, using BCG in the bladder of patients with uh, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, early forms of bladder cancer, and noted this was a very early study, just six patients in fact, and, and uh, noted a, a pretty uh, robust response in those patients. And of course, this has been corroborated in large trials since then. And so it's sort of a, a really a really great example of these early observations making their way into clinical care over, um, over time. So the current role of BCG is really central to how we treat um, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. 
Um, like most uh, cancers, we begin by staging the disease and sort of categorizing it into this non-muscle invasive superficial form or the more advanced form, which is treated in a separate manner. And in the non-muscle invasive form, we've, uh, we then put people into sort of risk categories. And so this is a table, uh, which is not meant to sort of the details are less important here, but the point is to highlight that patients are then placed into low risk, intermediate risk and high risk groups. And it's really in this intermediate risk and high risk groups that we found that there's a, a significant um, improvement in the quality or it's not in the quality, but in the, in the, uh, in the outcomes of patients who receive therapy in their bladder. And importantly, this intermediate risk group um, responds well both to BCG and uh, other types of intravesical therapy, chemotherapy. Um, and then BCG is, is, is often really um, you know, prioritized in this high risk group because of several observational studies and, and, um, and studies that sort of corroborate that BCG is really important in this group. That's sort of how we use BCG um, currently. The shortages um, that we've experienced have, this is now, um, you know, this is now not new. Unfortunately, we've had several global supply shortages of BCG and ultimately it's driven by an imbalance of supply and demand as, as we all might have expected. Um, and it starts with limited supply. Uh, to begin with, BCG is, um, is not like many other forms of vaccines where um, they can be manufactured at very high rates or it's not like farm, uh, other chemotherapies where um, it's a chemical reaction that can be um, sort of made in a, in a pharmaceutical company, but instead it's, a, it's an actual organism that has to be grown and cultured. And um, on top of that, it's not a particularly easy organism to grow. Um, this group of organisms, the mycobacteria they're called, are, are really fastidious, which is really just a way to say that they're difficult to grow. Um, they require really special media and um, and don't grow very uh, very easily on common um, you know platforms that we use to grow other bacteria, and they're very slow. Uh, their doubling time because of the cell wall that they have around them is is you know somewhere in the sixteen to twenty hour mark, and just as a way to compare. Um, E. coli, which is a really commonly cultured organism in labs, has a 20 minute doubling time. And so, the, you know, this is orders of magnitude slower. And as a result, um, it's, uh, it can take very long amounts of time to get, uh, to get this to grow. And because of the special augers that are uh, used for this that are very high in fat and other, um, other things that are really unique to, to, uh, to this group of organisms, it's really prone to contamination which we've seen sort of um, contamination creep in and, and, um, and impact the ability for certain pharmaceutical companies to supply really large quantities of this. And so because of these things in the US, we really only have one pharmaceutical company that, that manufactures uh, BCG, uh, clinical BCG for intravesical use for in the bladder use, and that's Merck. Um, there was another uh, pharmaceutical company, Sanofi um, Pasteur, which really ran into some of these issues that we discussed here, including widespread contamination and issues with their production and, and, uh, and stopped production in 2012 and has not um, since re, uh, restarted it. And so um, this is a sort of a challenging production process and we're relying on really a single manufacturer for this. And this is sort of all happening as there's increasing global demand for BCG. Um, uh, th you know, the rest of the world is increasingly using it, which is, uh, is a really important uh, step in improving the care that folks around the world are receiving for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, but um, it also strains supply lines. So what has been the response um, to the BCG shortage? Well, Merck has, uh, has um, really several statements throughout every, you know, when these shortages occur about increasing the production of a BCG by their, uh, by their manufacturing plants. And um, they've, uh, in 2021, the most recent uh, announcement was that they would be doubling and hopefully even more than, uh, more than doubling their uh, manufacturing capacity for BCG. Unfortunately, construction of a new facility takes time and it's not expected to be completed for another several years. And in the meantime, um, they've committed to 
uh, ramping up their current capacity so to try to increase production. There's been a, a, a concurrent effort to sort of make sure that BCG is used appropriately. And by that, we mean avoiding BCG use in low risk patients, which, um, you know, some of these, the use of BCG in different patient populations has evolved over time. And, and in the past, it, it really has taken time for us to understand patients that are best selected to benefit from BCG. And some of these old habits of using BCG in all non-muscle invasive bladder cancer sort of die hard and it takes a long time for um, clinicians and, um, and uh, groups to adjust to this. But um, campaigns to try to limit BCG use in, in low risk individuals, those folks that have the, the most indolent sort of uh, low risk bladder cancers who seem to not really derive a meaningful benefit from BCG compared to other therapies. Um, that's, this has been a, an important step in trying to uh, make sure that the BCG can get to those folks who really benefit most from it. That intermediate risk group, if you'll remember, um, had really two options, both BCG and intravesical chemotherapies. And there have been multiple observational and, and randomized studies that have compared BCG to um, chemo certain chemotherapies in the bladder. And in this group who really sort of get an initial induct, what we call an induction um, treatment, um, they seem to derive a very meaningful benefit from using alternatives to BCG. And so in that intermediate risk group, we really shifted to, um, to using the intravesical chemotherapy rather than BCG. And that again, sort of is able to allow BCG to be used in that highest risk group who seem to derive the most meaningful benefit. And the sort of the last, the last step of, of um, at least of, of uh, this category here is, is um, what we talk about uh, maintenance dosing. And so, uh, as some of you likely know, um, when we begin intravesical therapy, we sort of start with a six week induction course, which is sort of a, a hard hitting upfront induction treatment in the bladder. And often we will then pursue maintenance dosing at three and six, and then every six, six months after that. And the duration of maintenance dosing seems to uh, be related to response rates and preventing recurrences. Um, and part of making sure that BCG's use is available for induction dosing means that we are having to sort of prioritize induction dosing instead of indefinite maintenance uh, dosing. And the differences between one and three year, you know, there, 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 is, there is some benefit to continuing maintenance BCG um, in the long term, but that benefit is small, especially compared to the ability to give that initial induction dose. And so that's a, another way we're sort of trying to make sure that BCG is available upfront in that really high risk group. And the last thing is that BCG comes in a specific dose and, and it has been studied in, in a diluted dose in half doses and a third dosing. Um, and again, multiple uh, ex multiple groups have published their experience with this. And this is just sort of a smattering of different groups that have tried to study this, including a randomized trial. And, and we find that um, especially in this intermediate risk group, and especially um, early on, it's, it's, it's reasonable to use a, a more dilute form of BCG, which can allow a limited supply to last um, much longer and be able to be accessible to lots of patients. And finally, uh, we have some of these alternatives that I've, I've alluded to throughout the talk. And intravesical chemotherapy is a wonderful alternative to BCG for certain patients, um, include, especially those low and intermediate risk patients. Uh, mitomycin, uh, mitomycin C is, a, is um, one example of um, medication that's useful as well as combination uh, therapy. Gemcitabine with mitomycin or gemcitabine and docetaxel have and in certain select patient groups have shown really uh, great efficacy and, and are a really useful alternative to BCG um, for some patients. Um, there are novel therapies coming down the pike. Um, immunotherapy and uh, immunotherapy is uh, being widely used and tested in bladder cancer as well as many other cancers. And there's a lot of exciting studies that are looking at the use of immunotherapy in non-muscle invasive early bladder cancer. And it's, uh, it's entirely possible that in the following years, our dependence on BCG may shift and may be attenuated by novel therapies that are coming, uh, that are being tested. And uh, antibody drug conjugates are similarly are a novel class of 
medications that have been recently FDA approved for really advanced bladder cancer and uh, are currently being investigated by um, many here at the University of Washington, including Dr. Grievous and Dr. Wright, who have an interest in these drugs, um, but uh, also across the country and the world. Um, and again, they will, they will likely sort of change the landscape in the coming years as to how we treat this early disease. Cystectomy is also an option for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, especially if um, we feel that either the treatments are not working very well early on or uh, they're not accessible or not well tolerated. Um, and cystectomy has, uh, of course, very significant morbidity as uh, Dr. Gore is going to speak about this uh, soon, but it also is very effective in the non-muscle invasive uh, stage. And so that's also an alternative option in, in early uh, bladder cancer. And finally, clinical trials. Um, and uh, and uh, just a word about clinical trials. You know, this space is a very exciting space, and and uh, this is this is of course not meant to be read, but just to say this is a this is a paper from a couple of years ago, which sort of tried to try to catalog the ongoing clinical trials at that period in time, about two years ago. And this is their table. You could see how many clinical trials and how much excitement there is in this field. And and the sort of my point with this slide is just to say that as these clinical trials are borne out and new therapies are developed and established, I think that um, our reliance on this BCG shortage will change. So in conclusions, BCG is really a, a remarkable uh, therapy that has, uh, you know, has really helps a lot of people and it's a, an important part of how we treat bladder cancer. Uh, but supply and demand challenges just continue to plague this medicine and, and, uh, and this has been ongoing, ongoing for uh, quite some time now. Um, our response is uh, summarized here. Uh, the company's attempting to increase production. We're attempting to triage and use the medicine appropriately in the right patient groups, uh, use sparingly, and then use alternatives when available. And then, uh, as I mentioned, clinical trials are uh, eagerly awaited to change uh, sort of how we rely on this medicine. And uh, with that, I'm happy to take your, take your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Galli. Wonderful presentation. Thank you for doing great work uh, in our group and I uh, appreciate all, all the aspects that you covered. Uh, I, I would like to ask you, if you don't mind, to an answer a good question here by uh, Joe Jacobs in the chat room about uh, intermediate risk assessment and treatment, uh, and, uh, and then any other questions that may pop up. Great talk. In the interest of time, we'll move on uh, to the next speaker. I'm very, very excited and honored to introduce to you Dr. John Gore. Uh, Dr. Gore is a professor in the Department of Virology. He's a Jesse Bridges and Dow Professor in Prostate Cancer Research in UW Medicine, and uh, he has made significant contributions in the field. He's well known internationally, I would say. And uh, John, thanks for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you for having me. Um, I am going to talk about a study that we run out of the University of Washington, um, but I want to highlight it more as an example of some of the novel ways we're trying to think about research, some of the ways we're trying to think about how to inform clinical practice, how to help patients make better decisions about their bladder cancer care. Um, and so this is sort of a, an example that I think is pertinent to a lot of other aspects of bladder cancer care. So I'm uh, the principal investigator for a study called SISTO, uh, which I can't take credit for the acronym, but it's the best acronym I've been a part of. It's the comparison of intravesical therapy and surgery as treatment options for bladder cancer. Um, basically, this stems from this sort of newer methodology for research that we call patient-centered outcomes research. It seeks to answer these questions like, given what is unique about me, uh, me as an individual, but me in terms of my cancer, you know, what can I expect will happen to me with whatever treatment I'm offered? Um, what are those treatment options and how can I balance the benefits and harms of them? Is there anything that's within my power uh, to improve the outcomes that are, that are most important to me? Um, and what about the system around us? How can the healthcare system work to improve, you know, my health outcomes? <clears throat> so this stemmed from some work that we started, uh, gosh, now, um, about eight years ago to better understand what research questions are important to patients. And so we partnered with the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network to create the Patient Survey Network. Um, and we started by just trying to understand what research questions patients themselves think are important. 
Um, <clears throat> Now, a lot of these questions are questions that we as clinical experts also really would prioritize, but there are some questions that bubbled up to the surface that maybe we hadn't thought about as clinical providers. Like, for example, what are the best ways to decrease pain and discomfort from procedures like cystoscopy or placing the catheter? Or what are the best ways to improve quit rates for men and women who are smoking at the time of their bladder cancer diagnosis? Those are questions that came organically out of the patient survey network. But the number one question is probably our number one question as well, highlighted also by Dr. Galley, which is how can we make better decisions about what to do when BCG doesn't work, um, whether it's bladder removal or other different salvage treatments. Um, and so we actually distributed these prioritized research questions to organizations that fund research and the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, which is a federal institute, actually made one of our PSN questions a priority topic. And they say that the best grants are the ones that are written for you. Uh, and so we actually um, applied uh, to do a comparative effectiveness research study. And this is our schema. So what we are comparing in Cisto is we're comparing patients whose non-muscle invasive cancer has recurred um, and for whom we would strongly consider, you know, something aggressive because we fear that if we give them a salvage treatment into the bladder that doesn't work, we could lose a window of curability. So these are patients for whom we would consider taking out their bladder. And then we would also consider these alternatives, whether they're um, intravesical chemotherapies, um, there are newer IV immunotherapies that we give for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. And this is a situation where patient preferences are very strong. And we found that you know, within the patient survey network, there was only about 10% willingness to consider a flip of, of a coin deciding between these two drastically different treatment options. So unlike most clinical trials where you're assigned a treatment based on a random you know, assignment, here patients and their doctors choose their treatment and then we follow their outcomes over the next 12 to 36 months. Um, and this was that willingness to randomize data I showed you. Now, <clears throat> why is this sort of a novel thing? Well, as researchers, we often think that the best evidence, the things that really change clinical care are randomized controlled trials, these flip of the coin trials, because in those trials, you get an even balance between the two groups that you're comparing. But some comparisons just can't be randomized. And unfortunately, our literature in urologic cancer treatment is littered with these trials where we plan to enroll a bunch of patients but because maybe we didn't do the simple act of asking patients what's important to them and asking patients if they would sign up for a trial with this design, some of these studies have actually failed to appropriately you know, accrue the, the, the needed number of patients to make meaningful comparisons. So that's why this is an observational study. And we would put this under a category of pragmatic trials. These are trials where maybe we're not doing these super clean comparisons of perfect patient A with perfect patient B, but they're more applicable to the real world. And we find that this is actually really important to patients. But in order to do a real world comparison, we need a lot of patients and we need a lot of settings. And so this study is taking place currently at 32 sites, but we're expanding to 40 sites uh, in the next three months. And that's gonna ensure that we have a large patient population but also a very diverse patient population so that we can look at all the different subgroups of interest that we really care about <clears throat> in terms of making this comparison. It's also gonna be more pragmatic in that it's gonna allow a more flexible definition of recurrent bladder cancer. The leading individual recruiter for Cisto across all sites is Dr. Jonathan Wright. Um, and um, and you know, one reason he's been very successful in recruiting patients for Cisto is that a lot of the patients that we see at the University of Washington have already had a number of treatments, and now they're recurring from their second or their third line treatment, and those are really perfect patients for Cisto, because what we really care about is a patient that has a meaningful and clinically concerning bladder cancer recurrence. And so <clears throat> in order to understand, you know, what is the right treatment for me, given my personal characteristics, we have to think about what personal characteristics are important. You know, Dr. Nyame highlighted the fact that there are gender disparities in bladder cancer outcomes. So it's important that we oversample women. 20% uh, of bladder cancer patients are women. So if you look at our subgroup so far, we've recruited about 240 patients. 
we have about 25% women. So we should be able to understand how these, these comparisons relate not only to the population at large, but also specifically to women, to non-white patients, to patients we would consider maybe to be older patients, to those with multiple comorbid health conditions, and other factors that we think are important, like whether or not you have a caregiver that contributes to your social support and clinical care. Um, this is sort of highlighting that importance of real world data, right? In a laboratory, you know, we might see this patient that has this perfect history that we can pigeonhole into this very clean clinical category of BCG unresponsive non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. These are the patients we want to put on industry-sponsored clinical trials to compare new, you know, interventional therapeutic drugs. But this is the real world. And this is actually a case history from a patient that was submitted to us by one of our sites to say, gosh, is this patient eligible? And you can see that they've had a litany of recurrences and a, a pretty strong exposure to a number of prior therapies. And this patient is eligible for, for Cysto. This is a concerning clinical recurrence of high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, but it just doesn't neatly fit into one of our clean bladder cancer categories. So <clears throat> what I mean to highlight with Cysto is what we would consider to be a paradigm that we think researchers should really consider, which is that you know, all too often the research questions we come up with are serendipitous or they're because of a conversation we had in clinic or an idea we had based on a lecture that we heard. But maybe rather than relying on serendipity, you know, we can actually ask patients what they think is important. Patients have the lived experience of their cancer trajectory and that lived experience can generate some really you know, practice informing um, research questions. If we know what questions are important, we can look to the literature and figure out what is known about those treatments. So we can do high level, what we would call evidence synthesis. For questions where the evidence does not help us, we don't know exactly what the right treatment is for the right patient at the right time. We can do studies like Cysto, where we are actually creating the evidence. And once we know what the right treatment is for the right patient at the right time, we can build new tools to integrate that information into clinical practice through things like you know, the EPIC electronic health record or other interventions. And we're trying to build things beyond Cysto. So we have a study in planning right now that looks at chemo radiation and radical cystectomy for muscle invasive bladder cancer. Um, and my colleague, Angie Smith, who's a partner of mine in this work at the University of North Carolina is looking at an adaptive trial to try to reduce cystoscopy related discomfort. So different ways of building out these patient centered research questions into what we would think would be practice informing results. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Wonderful presentation and such a great effort. I think this is so important to have this pragmatic right, approach in a real world setting and see the needs of our patients in real life. So thank you for leading this amazing work and all the research you are putting in effort into this. Um, I will welcome colleagues and also the audience to put questions in the chat room. Uh, there's so much excitement about these talks. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, move on to the next speaker. And John, if you are willing to answer any questions in the chat room, it will be awesome. And thanks again for all the, all the great work. Uh, the next speaker, I'm very, very excited and honored uh, to uh, introduce to you, uh, Dr. Sarah Sutka. Uh, Dr. Sutka joined us about four years ago uh, from Cook County in Chicago. She's an associate professor in the Department of Urology. Uh, she's leading great work, as you will see in a few seconds, uh, talking about resilience, talking about assessment of fitness for surgery, nutritional intervention, and uh, many other great initiatives. So uh, uh, Sarah, without further delay, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everybody. It is my pleasure to be with you today. I'm going to just maximize my slides here. Um, can everybody see everything? Okay, great. Um, well, it is, I, I love these forums and I, it's really an honor to have an opportunity to speak with you all today. For those of you who know me, um, you know that what I'm going to talk to you about today is one of my passions, both in terms of clinical medicine and, and it, it's really the, the hub of my research program. So I'm excited to share with you some of the things that we're working on building out. And the focus of this talk is on personalizing risk stratification, measuring frailty, fitness and resilience, and understanding how we can use that to improve our outcomes in bladder cancer care. So when I think about windows of opportunity where we can intervene in the, the care path or the care trajectory of a patient's 
a disease process with bladder cancer. We can intervene before someone gets treatment and try to help them get stronger. We can implement pathways during treatment, such as our enhanced recovery after surgery pathways that many of you are familiar with, to optimize outcomes and ensure that we're providing the highest level of care during treatment. And then we can really think about how we can intervene during survivorship periods to help patients thrive as they are recovering from treatment and moving forward with living their life as a cancer survivor. But what I'm excited about is how really personalized detailed risk stratification can help us personalize treatment election and then also inform all of the interventions that we can implement across the trajectory of caring for someone to help them live well before treatment during treatment, and then as they enter the period of survivorship. And so when many of you have talked to us about your cancers, we always talk about things like the stage of the cancer, the histology or the type of bladder cancer, the grade, which all inform what treatment options may be available. But that's only part of the picture. Staging the cancer is not, uh, each of these cancers can exist within completely different individuals. And when we think about the factors that influence the decision-making and risk assessment in patients with um, any of the different cancers that we deal with who are uh, uh, with bladder cancer, it's a fairly complex calculus. Those We have the oncologic risk factors, but we have to think also about technical considerations such as a patient's anatomy and prior surgical history, the team that we're working in, our experience, our hospital experience, our availability of, of OR time, and this has been something that we've all been especially cognizant of in the setting of the COVID um, pandemic, the safety and complication proof profile of, teacher, of the treatment options we have, cost comes into play, and financial toxicity is something that we have increasing uh, appreciation of the implications of for our patients. And then also we have to get into these very granular patient-based factors. So the components of the calculus really are, are basically balancing a patient's own strengths, their resilience, their capital, their fitness against the risks of the disease, the treatments, and then the competing comorbidities and potential other vulnerabilities that, it may, that may be within a patient themselves and be, be specific to that patient. And so it ends up being a fairly nebulous calculus. And what we classically fall back on is a, a, a physician's clinical acumen their complex sort of intrinsic calculation and weighing of these risks and benefits in, in, in combination with the patient. And, and to some degree, this has, been, this has been termed the eyeball test where basically we assess a patient's fitness for treatment by implicitly um, forming, uh, weighing these risks and benefits. But I always think back to a talk that I heard when I was in medical school. So Atul Gawande, who some of you may know, is a endocrine surgeon at the Brigham Women's Hospital at Harvard. He's also a great writer. Who, who has written for the New Yorker and a number of really amazing uh, uh, books about sort of the theory of how we can practice medicine better. And when I heard him give this commencement, commencement speak, which when I was in medical school, he, he, he said, count something. He said, no matter what you ultimately do in medicine, a doctor should be a scientist in his or her world. In the simplest terms, this means we should count something. If you count something interesting to you, I tell you, you will find something interesting. And so while we have this implicit calculus, I think what we really need is data. We need quantitative, reliable, and validated patient-specific assessments that then can ultimately guide the further testing that we do for patients, the interventions that we recommend to optimize outcomes, and then really help patients personalize their treatment so that they can get to the end of their quote unquote cancer journey into survivorship as well as living as well as they possibly can. And so what I'd like to just focus on a little bit and highlight are some emerging personalized risk stratification tools that I'm really excited about and that we're building into our clinical care pathways. In the age of increasing obesity, which many of you are gonna be familiar with, there's been a lot of talk about how obesity impacts bladder cancer outcomes. However, I've been interested and I've been working since about 2014 on reframing this obesity conversation because as we all know, your BMI or body mass index, which is simply a calculation that, that takes into account height and weight, can really not convey what a person looks like. And you can be a NFL linebacker and technically be morbidly obese, or you can you, your body composition can be very different. And so one of the things I've been interested in is using data we already gather which are CT scans, which we use routinely to stage the cancers that we're dealing with and, and calculating from that and estimating from that body composition. So muscle mass, 
and adipose tissue, and then using that to understand how those, that balance of muscle and fat or fat free mass and fat mass affect outcomes. And here's just two examples of patients with the exact same body mass index. And you can see the difference in their skeletal muscle, which is highlighted in red. And you can tell that if we were looking at this patient from the outside, we wouldn't have that, that data, but that data is actually already in the CT scans that we're obtaining. We just have to extract it. And this is something that I got excited about doing my master's thesis when I was in my fellowship. We studied uh, over 200 patients at the Mayo Clinic and found that in a, patient, a population of, of patients going through radical cystectomy, almost 70% of patients had severe muscle deficiency. And when we looked at how that associated with outcomes, Patients with severe muscle deficiency were almost two times more likely to die within five years after cystectomy than those patients who had normal muscle mass. We've done a lot more work since that time and we've looked at, and this is something that is really becoming an active area of research. And we've found that muscle mass actually is associated not only with overall survival, but also cancer specific survival, as well as surgical complication risks. So we have a fairly powerful tool as long as we use it. Excitingly, also body composition is modifiable and dynamic. It's something that we can change, but also our treatments can impact. And something that we've been working on, I started working on in Chicago, and then we've built out here, is really tracking how body composition changes with the treatments that we use. So with chemotherapy, we notice that patients actually can, uh, in, on average, lose about 6% of their muscle mass over a really short period of time, only about 110 days or just over three months. So if we're taking a patient population that already is at high risk of being low in terms of their muscle mass and then giving them medicine that might further reduce that, well, this is an active area where we potentially could improve outcomes if we can somehow find a way to reduce the loss of muscle and or use that time period where patients are getting ready for cystectomy in getting chemotherapy to actually help them build their muscle. So um, one other exciting uh, sort of area of, of research in this area is that we're actually now starting to use machine learning and artificial intelligence to leverage um, the CT scans that we're already getting and automatically start collecting this data. And we have a partnership with a, a wonderful uh, scientist at Harvard, Florian Fintelman, who I work with closely, um, where we are starting to be able to automatically extract this data from the CT scans that we're all getting in clinical practice. So this is a very active area of interest. But in addition to just understanding what people look like, we also have to assess function. And frailty is this metric that starts to bring together both muscle strength, but also muscle ability. And frailty describes a medical syndrome with multiple causes and contributors that is characterized by low strength, low endurance, and low physiologic function. And it really is something that is very different from disability and comorbidity. There's some overlap, but it's a distinct idea. And the thing that's important about frailty is that it's associated with vulnerability for bad outcomes, such as dependency and or death with treatments and or disease. And one of the important things about frailty is that it's a global manifestation that really takes into account all of those factors that we talked about at the very beginning um, that, imp that, that impact our decision-making uh, in terms of the treatment options that we recommend to patients who are dealing with bladder cancer. And frailty is common. Depending on how we characterize it, it affects patients undergoing cystectomy in 15 to 70% of cases. And we can use very simple tools to measure it, such as the clinical frailty scale, which basically assesses overall, again, gestalt assessment of, of physical wellness. There are also more granular uh, diagnosis-based metrics. But the important thing also about frailty is that it's dynamic. We can start with one level of frailty. Someone can develop increasing frailty with treatment, but then with a uh, further intervention, we can actually help people recover and become more robust. So it's a very powerful tool that again is modifiable and something that it's, a, it's an outcome that we can impact, that can impact outcomes. And it's important because not only is it associated with mortality, but it's associated with things like complications. So we really think that we should be assessing frailty and physiologic age in our patients who are undergoing evaluation for bladder cancer, and that this is something that we should be taking into account when we are recommending specific treatments. The thing that I've been working on most recently is getting even more specific and using what are called comprehensive geriatric, and I put that in parentheses because it's actually something that can be used in patients who don't necessarily meet uh, are not necessarily older in years, but also patients who have a lot of other medical issues. These assessments, which 
are multi-dimensional evaluations that are really 360 degree views of a patient taking into account their function and ability, the other diseases they uh, also may harbor, their mental health and cognitive function, as well as their support networks and their specific needs and priorities. And the goal again here is to identify risks and direct plans to, ident to target the vulnerabilities that we identify, again, assessing physiologic age, and then really having a good idea of a patient's own innate risk factors. And these are highly specific. They are more, they give us a great idea of, of patients need with their activities of daily living. They can help us to understand specific vulnerabilities that may not be identified identified by our, our standard risk assessments. And then based on what we find, we can create very specific prescriptions to target any vulnerabilities that we identify so that we can ultimately fix the problems or at least mitigate some problems that could become really um, real, they, that could really impact our success of our treatments going down the line. And they're important. CGAs are able to not only help us predict risks that are important, such as ICU admissions, early mortality, or a patient not being able to get home after surgery. But when we use them before surgery, they can help us intervene and reduce complications, reduce postoperative delirium, get patients out of the hospital, the hospital faster, get them home, and reduce death in some situations. And one thing that I think is really important is people really, our patients prioritize their independence. And we, we know from, from prior studies that patients who undergo these CGAs as part of in-hospital care are more likely to return home and be living in their home independently up to a year afterwards, which is an important outcome for patients, especially older patients who are dealing with really severe potential other diseases such as bladder cancer. But one thing that I always worry about is we talk a lot about vulnerability and risk, and those are really negative framing, uh, framings of these assessments. And so I kind of, had, when I first got to UW, I wanted to turn this conversation on its head a little bit. And we have one really phenomenal resource at UW, which is this resilience lab, which was built out of the, the undergrad campus by one of my colleagues and long-term actually friends. We went to college together. Dr. Ann Browning is one of our associate, assistant deans. She started the Resilience Lab and they developed validated assessments by which we can measure an individual's ability to maintain psychological, to, to maintain psychological strength and physical functioning in the face of stressors. So our ability to bounce back. And we've developed a Euro-Oncology Resilience Assessment over the past couple of years, which many of you may have actually participated in which assesses things like psychometric capital, resilience, eff efficacy, thriving, and self-compassion, all of which are important assessments in terms of understanding how a patient is going to respond to their disease and respond to the stresses of their therapies. And these are actually also domains that we can improve if someone might have a, a weakness in one of these areas. So ultimately, how are we all putting this together at the University of Washington? We have over the last couple of years developed what we're calling an augmented comprehensive geriatric assessment. And I thank many of you who participated in this research work um, where we are, have, are taking into account these 360 degree assessments, which we are performing in clinic. Coming down the line, we're going to start implementing a, a very rapid 10 minute self-assessment that patients can fill out that basically gives us a really detailed view of a lot of these domains that may not be captured in standard risk assessments. And then we're, we're uh, implementing these resilience assessments and also body composition assessments to really understand a patient inside and out in addition to understanding their cancer. And then that ultimately is what's going to, what we're, what we're using to help us further hone the personalization of treatment recommendations and also the recommendations for the other interventions that could help patients get through their treatments more effectively. And with that, I wanna thank you very much for your attention today. I'm happy to take any questions and thanks for joining us. Yeah, it's just, it's just so fantastic to be part of the work that she's, the doctor is doing. It really is helping change our practice and our management and improving our patient care. So I'm gonna go, we can keep answering in the chat as they come through. I'm gonna go ahead and move on. We've been talking about kind of the, around the, more on the surgical side. We're gonna to transition to one of our colleagues, Dr. Jay Liao, who's a radiation oncologist and talk about uh, radiation bladder preservation therapies for bladder cancer. It's a very, an area that we at the UW SCCA are very interested in and uh, have provided this for a, a number of patients. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Liao.
Dr. Leo, I think you're muted. Good morning. There he is. Sorry, just suddenly had an internet lag, so hopefully you can hear me okay. Yes. Okay, give me a second just to pull up the slides here. Hey, well, good morning, everyone. I uh, really want to thank the, uh, the event organizers for inviting me and my team here as well that I really thoroughly enjoy working with and definitely want to thank the patients and families that allow us to participate in their care. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, the role for radiation therapy in uh, bladder preservation and the use of chemo and radiation therapy to try to preserve the bladder and select patients uh, with bladder cancer. So the objectives are to review the role for radiation or chemo radiation and specifically patients with muscle invasive uh, bladder cancer. Uh, I'll be talking briefly about some of the radiation technologies that we use and some of the interesting research and kind of future directions of this work. So as Dr. Gali had discussed, uh, there's an important distinction and breakdown in this uh, staging of bladder cancer, where about 70% of patients have non-muscle invasive bladder cancer that's not quite into the muscle yet, but about 30% of patients have muscle invasive bladder cancer. And that's an important distinction because that grouping of patients, we have to go bigger as far as the treatment in order to have an opportunity to cure the cancer. So for muscle invasive bladder cancer, generally surgical management with radical cystectomy has long been considered the cornerstone of treatment for most patients. And this is a large procedure as the, the name would imply, it involves removing the entire bladder. There's additional pelvic structures at hand, uh, lymph node dissection, and importantly, diversion of the urinary tract and reconstruction, which many times means an external diversion or bag for many patients as the optimal approach. This is often preceded by chemotherapy up front to give us the best outcomes. And with this approach, there's a pretty high rate of cancer control in the pelvis. But obviously, there's definitely major surgical risks to consider with going through large, such a large procedure. And there's major quality of life considerations to weigh as well. And then how about those individuals that are not quite healthy enough for surgery? How do we approach that? So we asked the question of, is it possible to preserve the organ, our organ preservation, and to uh, basically have our cake and eat it too. So can we treat the cancer effectively and also preserve the native bladder? And this is an approach that we use for numerous other cancers that are treated with radiation therapy or concurrent chemo radiation uh, successfully. So there's cancers of the head and neck. We use this frequently in prostate cancer, and then some colorectal cancers and anal cancer that's also long been a standard approach um, and also some newer approaches being looked at. So how about for bladder cancer? Uh, does this work here? So this technique evolved uh, what's called trimodality therapy, which uh, involves the surgeons as well as collaboration with radiation oncology and our medical oncologists. So the surgeons are still key for the success of this approach. And this involves removing the cancer endoscopically uh, with surgery as clearly as possible and then doing combined chemotherapy and radiation therapy together. And this approach was pioneered by our colleagues at Harvard Hospital, Massachusetts General, as well as a number of international groups back in the day. And like many things in medicine, this is one thing that we stumbled on a little bit by accident. Uh, and basically there were studies in Europe that were looking at patients that were undergoing surgery, but they were undergoing chemo and radiation before surgery. And they found that there was a pretty significant rate of complete responses by the time the cancer was removed at the time of surgery which led to the thought that maybe we could treat primarily with radiation and chemotherapy then and potentially avoid surgery. So this is the pathway that developed for this approach of trimodality therapy. It involves maximally clearing the cancer up front um, with the TURBT, which is a cystoscopy approach to remove the cancer and then doing combined chemo and radiation. And that's done over the course of about seven weeks of treatment. And when this technique first evolved, it involved a uh, split course approach we're about a little bit past halfway through the treatment. You do a repeat look into the bladder, see if the cancer has responded completely, take a biopsy. If it has responded, but generally it has in, in well-selected patients, then we complete an additional couple of weeks of chemo and radiation. If it hasn't responded, then um, we go in and we do an early uh, surgical salvage and go to cystectomy with the thought that this gives us a an early look in whether the cancer is responding. And then it's important to continue with long-term surveillance afterwards. 
Uh, in many patients now, uh, we have found that there's actually reasonable outcomes without doing that mid-course uh, repeat look and actually doing the treatment in a continuous course. So what are the outcomes of this? Um, well, it's, it's taken a while to gather the evidence for this and experience, but over numerous clinical trials or many years now, we have accumulated some data on this. And this is looking at um, cooperative group experience, which is kind of a coalition of multiple cancer hospitals in the US and we're involved in this as well. This is about 500 patients uh, with muscle invasive bladder cancer across numerous trials. And I won't go too much into all the details here, but about two thirds of the patients had what we would consider a little bit more favorable cancer optimal for this approach. And I would just highlight that the complete response rates in this experience was around 70%, which is pretty high. Unfortunately, there's still a, a need for a salvage cystectomy if the cancer does not respond or comes back in the, um, in the bladder in about a third or so of patients. And I'll show you in a little bit here that we're doing a bit better now than, than the outcomes compiled from this experience. And then the cancer survival outcomes were, were quite favorable and in line with kind of a, a favorable comparison with surgical techniques. And one important thing to highlight is that when you leave the bladder intact, there's still a chance that there could be cancer that still remains or that cancer comes back later. Uh, so this is an important thing to highlight that we discuss with our patients. So there's a chance that there could be muscle invasive uh, local failure, which may mean cystectomy as the next best approach in many patients in about 15% of cases. But actually, most of the time when there's recurrence in the bladder, it, it may be non-muscle invasive. So it may not necessarily entail uh, a salvage with cystectomy. This is about 30% of patients. An important thing to highlight also is that there still remains a risk of spread of the cancer elsewhere. That's a challenge also in our surgical paradigms as well, and an important area that we need to address to further improve the cure rate of these patients. Uh, I showed this slide just to show that we've gotten better with this approach of trimodality therapy over time. And over successive time periods, uh, you'll see that this complete response rate with chemo radiation has, in some of our contemporary series, approached high 80s to 90% or so, which is pretty encouraging, very high rates of cancer survival. And the rate of cystectomy has dropped from, you know, I showed you earlier that about 35% or so, and in early experiences was around 40%, but it's down to about 15% or so. And some of that comes from a better recognition of uh, careful patient selection for who we think will do well with this approach. Um, I'll highlight just what some of the uh, basic side effects are expected with radiation. There's definitely fatigue, there's nausea, and these are effects tied to both radiation and to chemotherapy. But you would expect the bladder gets irritated with basically irritated bladder symptoms of frequent urgent urination and burning with urination, more difficulty with urination and bowel effects, gastrointestinal effects are, are common in many. So the radiation can cause temporarily some loose stools, diarrhea and things like that during the treatment. And there's definitely risks of infection uh, just from some degree of immune suppression, both from chemotherapy and from the pelvic radiation. Uh, so does it really work? Uh, so there have been studies that have looked at the quality of life of patients that are long-term survivors from after chemo radiation. And as you'd expect, there's some short-term side effects with treatment at the end of treatment, but these generally recover over about six months after treatment. And most of the quality of life analyses show that the majority of patients that have a preserved bladder in the long-term have pretty satisfactory long-term bladder function. Um, and ongoing work is looking at you know, how these quality of life factors weigh and compare with surgery surgical managed patients versus trimodality therapy. One important thing that we've learned is that really careful patient selection is key with the best success for this approach. So we have basically found a whole litany of factors that we look at carefully. Basically, the, the smaller the tumor is, we have better outcomes, the better it's cleared by our surgeons up front, the less extensive degree of muscle invasion and normal kidney drainage as well and good bladder function to begin with uh, and bladder capacity to begin with. Uh, so basically having a bladder that's worth sparing and not too affected by the cancer. An important key to highlight also is that close surveillance is important afterwards because like I highlighted, there's chance of in bladder recurrence in the long term. So we want to catch those recurrences early to give us the best chance for successful early salvage. So it turns out only a small subset of patients are really the most optimal candidates for this approach. Uh, but sometimes we have to relax those factors because we see many patients that are just not optimally healthy enough to safely undergo surgery. So we sometimes do have to treat with radiation therapy, even though the best cancer therapy may actually be surgery for those individuals. Uh, and what if it doesn't work? Uh, well, salvage cystectomy may be possible, but it's definitely more complicated and has a little higher risk of complication for sure compared to upfront cystectomy. 
So there's definitely important considerations to weigh in this decision up front for our patients. I'll just show a little bit of just a few slides of radiation techniques and how they've evolved over time. So this shows kind of an older approach with what we called four field box because the radiation fields basically created a box radiation distribution of coverage. And basically we use large uh, radiation fields that come from the front and back and from the sides uh, targeting the bladder area. Because without being able to visualize the bladder, we have to treat with large enough fields that we don't miss because there can be variability from day to day. Uh, this is a little bit more like how we treat patients in the modern era. So we use linear accelerator machines that are able to deliver very focused high energy x-ray radiation beams, many times using this approach called volumetric modulated arc therapy, where the beams come from all around delivering sharp uh, radiation coverage once all that's added together. And this is a patient that I treated uh, in the past. We also have techniques now with being able to align more precisely to the bladder because you can imagine the bladder is pretty variable day to day and there can be changes in how full the bladder is and how much coffee you had in the morning and other things. So this shows a planning CT scan used to design the treatment and in the treatment room we're able to acquire what's called a comb beam CT scan that basically aligns to how the anatomy shows an image of what the anatomy looks like at the time of treatment each day. And we fuse these images together to, to achieve sort of precise alignment with our radiation coverage each day. So we've definitely have gotten better as far as our ability to target tumors um, precisely. This is some of the interesting work that we're involved in here. We're one of the uh, first in the world actually to report this approach of better being able to target the tumor on a daily basis. So even with CT scan, which I showed you, it can be a little bit hard to actually visualize the site of where the bladder cancer is. So we helped develop this approach of where you see where we paint where the cancer was with injecting this uh, dissolvable tracer uh, through a cystoscopy approach. And then we can image that, which helps us both to plan the treatment and kind of localize where the cancer was. You can see from this red arrow here, and then to align from a daily basis with the treatment and maybe even shrink the radiation fields. So how do surgery and chemo radiation stack up? Uh, well, it's it's been a hard comparison and we haven't been able to really do a head-to-head -head study. So we would love to have seen Floyd Mayweather and Manny Pacquiao in their prime compete together. We would have loved to see the early 70s Lakers and the 90s Bulls at their peak head-to-head uh, -to, -head to see who would have won out, but we haven't been able to do with bladder cancer. And one of the challenges has been just, uh, it's these are such different therapies and not everyone is you know, equally a suitable candidate for having a big surgery operation or having chemo and radiation. So we tried our best to do some comparisons of this and these definitely have limitations when you're not doing randomized trials, but at least some of the retrospective comparisons of this show Reasonable outcomes, uh, you know, with historic uh, surgical series and chemo radiation series as far as the survival outcomes achieved. So there's certainly this, this is a viable approach in, in well-selected patients. So how do we make some of these decisions? Well, it's, it's a challenge. There's so many things to weigh, you know, with the, the risk of surgery, the risk of chemo radiation, and with weighing the cancer and our patient preferences. So we, we developed this uh, bladder cancer multi-specialty, multidisciplinary clinic uh, back in 2014. Uh, partly to help address some of these major challenges with weighing all these factors. And Dr. Sukha spoke to just what are some of the major challenges with assessing patient fitness and things like that with being able to undergo these therapies. So this is a collaboration of urology, medical oncology, radiation oncology. We meet with our pathologists and radiologists, uh, as well as important supportive care services like our nursing and stoma services. Uh, to really discuss what the best option is for a patient kind of weighing these decisions. And uh, there's so many factors to weigh in. And it may not be as exciting as it is on TV, but I think we're a pretty dynamic group. <laughs> so some future directions here. Uh, we have this trial open here. We're looking at seeing whether we can further improve the outcomes of radiation and chemotherapy with some novel approaches. This is a trial in patients undergoing bladder preservation chemo radiation, looking at the addition of immunotherapy, which is an important uh, area of cancer therapeutic now. Uh, and this involves adding this drug called atezolizumab. And it's a randomized comparison of the standard chemo radiation versus doing that in addition to adding immunotherapy to see if that helps improve uh, the outcomes and success of this approach. So we're very excited about this study. We've had this open for a while here and are actively enrolling patients on it. So what about earlier stage cancer? So if this works for muscle invasive cancer, how about T1 cancer? So cancer that is invasive, but not quite into the muscle yet, can it help those individuals earlier on in the disease process? This study was just approached at one of our national meetings late last year, and we had it open here. 
and we're lucky to enroll a patient onto this. Uh, it was a small study that was a little bit exploratory, but looked at 30 patients with earlier cancer that's in invasive but not into the muscle and uh, looking at chemo radiation uh, for, uh, for that uh, grouping of patients showed uh, promising survival outcomes and um, a relatively low risk of local recurrence uh, in the bladder. And important to highlight this so far is looking pretty good. The three year freedom from having a salvage cystectomy was almost 90%. So this is something that we're excited about, about maybe expanding the, um, uh, the criteria for who may be a candidate for this approach. Uh, another thing we're excited about here is there's further technical advantage uh, advances in radiation oncology. And this is one of the reasons I'm so excited about the field and do what I do. We will have uh, this cutting edge machine very soon in our department in a few months, uh, which basically allows us not just to align very precisely to the daily anatomy, but actually to adapt the treatment uh, using actually artificial intelligence based replanning for the treatment design at the begin with to account for exactly how the anatomy looks like each day. So basically to continuously kind of adapt the treatment plan for what the anatomy looks like in the bladder area. So this is very exciting. Uh, and we're, we're hopeful to be involved in clinical trials in this space in the future. Okay, well, thank everyone for their time and attention and glad to take any questions. Thanks, Dr. Liao. It really is great to have this treatment. And also as everyone can see, trying to make it even better uh, with some of the research that we're doing. I'm going to transition now to Dr. Jessica Hawley, who is a medical oncologist who joined us uh, recently. We we're really excited to recruit her to be part of our team here. And she's going to talk about some of the uh, exciting new treatments that are available in, uh, uh, from, a, from a systemic therapy side. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Hawley. Thank you so much, Dr. Wright. Let me just get my slides up here. Okay, can you see okay? That's great. Okay, wonderful. Um, so good morning, everyone. Thanks so much to Dr. Wright and Grievous for inviting me to speak with you this morning. Um, as Dr. Wright said, I'm a GU medical oncologist here, assistant professor of medicine at UW, Fred Hutch in the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. The title of my talk today is Novel Targeted Therapies for Advanced Bladder Cancer. These are my disclosures. And so today I'm gonna to be speaking about a few of the newer therapies that are approved for patients with locally advanced or metastatic bladder cancer. And what I mean by this is bladder cancer that has spread outside of the bladder muscle wall to um, either local sites of disease or far distant sites of disease. I'd first like to point out that the standard, standard of care frontline therapy is still platinum-based combination chemotherapy. However, in the past few years, we've seen rapid acceleration of new drug approvals. Indeed, there are five new immunotherapies or immune checkpoint blockade molecules that are approved for the treatment of advanced bladder cancer. And these molecules work by stimulating a patient's own immune system to kill the cancer cells. Immune checkpoint molecules are often used in the second line setting after chemotherapy or in the first line setting for patients in whom chemotherapy might be too toxic. But today I'm not gonna talk about those. I'll speak about other drugs that are approved more recently in the second and the third line setting. And the first drug category is called antibody drug conjugates. And we're going to discuss two today, infortumab vedotin and saxituzumab govotecan. And the second category is a targeted um, therapy called ertafitinib. So first let's talk about antibody drug conjugates or ADCs. ADCs are a drug class that are designed as a targeted therapy for treating cancer. And ADCs consist of three parts. There's an antibody specific to a target protein on a cancer cell. There's a payload, often a chemotherapy molecule that kills the cancer cells. And then there's a chemical linker that attaches the payload to the antibody. Unlike standard chemotherapy, ADCs are intended to target and kill tumor cells while sparing healthy cells. And this schematic shows how ADCs selectively target cancer cells are then internalized by the cancer cell where the chemotherapy is released from the antibody and then ultimately leads to the cancer cell death. And there are two ADCs that are used for the treatment of advanced bladder cancer, infortumab vedotin or EV and saxituzumab govotecan or SG. And these two drugs differ somewhat in their composition. 
So first EV, it's a Nectin-4 directed antibody with a microtubule inhibitor conjugate called MMAE. And EV is approved for adult patients with locally advanced or metastatic bladder cancer who've previously received immune checkpoint blockade, platinum chemotherapy, or are ineligible for platinum chemotherapy and have received checkpoint blockade. In saxituzumab govitecan, it targets trope 2 and is coupled to another chemotherapy molecule, but this time it's called SN38. And this medicine is used in the third line setting after chemotherapy and immune checkpoint blockade. So first we'll talk a little bit more about EV, and I'm gonna give you a little bit of a um, overview of clinical trial design and drug development in doing so. So the clinical trial that led to the FDA approval of EV um, is shown here, and this is called EV301. It was a randomized multi-center phase three trial that was required by the FDA to confirm the clinical benefit of the original 2019 accelerated approval. This trial enrolled 608 patients with locally advanced metastatic bladder cancer who had received both immune checkpoint blockade and platinum chemotherapy. Patients were randomized to receive either EV um, for three weeks in a row of a four-week cycle or physician's choice single agent chemotherapy. The primary efficacy endpoint of this trial was overall survival, as is often the case in phase three trials. And here I'm showing you what's called a survival, a Kaplan-Meier survival curve. And we use these a lot in clinical trial assessment. On the bottom along the x-axis is overall survival and along the side or the x-axis is the percentage of patients surviving. Plotted in green are the patients who received EV and in orange are the patients who received chemotherapy. One of the key pieces of information we glean from these plots is the difference in the overall survival between the two groups. And if you, I'll draw your attention to the, the dash line at the 50 percentile mark. And if you go over to the right to each of the curves and then draw the lines down, you can see the difference in the median overall survival between the two groups, which is also listed in the box above. As you can see, patients who had EV had a median over survival that was four months longer than those patients who received chemotherapy. These findings were statistically significant, and this was the trial that supported full FDA approval of EV. So some of what, what is it that patients experience when they take EV? And some of the key side effects are listed here. Rash is common given that Nectin-4 is also expressed on the skin. And some of these rashes can actually be quite serious and there's a now a boxed warning on this. Other side effects include peripheral neuropathy owing to the type of chemotherapy that's conjugated to the antibody. Additionally, there are other laboratory abnormalities including high glucose as well as inflammation in the lungs. So now let's shift gears to saxituzumab govitecan. In April of last year, the FDA granted accelerated approval to SG for patients with locally advanced metastatic bladder cancer and previously received both platinum chemotherapy and immune checkpoint inhibition. And this accelerated approval was based on cohort one, shown here in orange, from the TROPHY phase two trial. And this was a single arm multi-center trial that enrolled 112 patients with locally advanced or metastatic bladder cancer who had received two prior lines of therapy. Patients received SG on days one and eight of a 21 or three day treatment cycle. And the main efficacy endpoints here, because it was a phase two trial, were tumor response, what we call objective response rate and the duration of response. So the plot on the right is what we call a waterfall plot. And each column or bar represents a single patient. The height and the directionality of the bar demonstrate how each patient's tumors changed relative to baseline with treatment. And so the bars pointing down show reduction in tumor size, whereas the bars pointing up show tumor growth. And what you can immediately notice is that most of the bars are indeed pointing down, demonstrating tumor reduction. And the dotted line at the 30% percentage line gives you a better sense of the proportion of patients that had a meaningful reduction in growth, or that is how many patients' tumors reduced by more than 30%. The table on the left lists all of the various clinical endpoints for the trial, and indeed the confirmed objective response was 27%, with 5% of patients achieving a complete response, and 22% of whom had partial responses. The median duration of response was 7.2 months, and the median time to that response was 1.6 months. 
There is a phase three trial, Tropics 04, which Dr. Grievous is intimately involved in, which is ongoing to confirm these findings and hopefully lead to full FDA approval soon. So what about the side effects of SG? Well, the most common side effects are neutropenia or a low white blood cell count, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and drug reaction or hypersensitivity. And now for the third new drug, ertafitinib. So ertafitinib is an oral medicine that selectively target, targets the fibroblast growth factor receptor or what we call FGFR. And FGFR is a transmembrane cell surface receptor that has what's called tyrosine kinase domains inside the cell. And what that really means um, is that it's a master activator of different cellular functions. So FGFR is involved in normal physiology, including tissue repair, wound healing, and inflammation. And when there's aberrant signaling of the FGFR receptor, um, which is often the case in bladder cancer, this can have an important role in driving cancer progression, survival, and formation of new blood vessels. There are often genomic alterations in FGFR that are identified in different cancers, including bladder cancer. So we look for these when we send your um, tumor samples for genetic testing. Erdofitinib then causes prolonged inhibition of FGFR and helps shut down the processes of the cancer cells that are listed here in this purple circle. So erdofitinib approval was also based on a phase two clinical trial called BLC2001. And here, 87 patients had locally advanced metastatic urothelial bladder, urothelial cancer that had progressed um, after one line of chemotherapy and had certain FGFR3 gene mutations or specific gene fusions with FGFR. Patients received ertafitinib at a starting dose of eight milligrams once daily, which was then increased to nine milligrams in patients um, who had stable and safe levels of phosphorus levels after uh, about two weeks of starting treatment. The major efficacy outcome in this study was again objective response rate, and the confirmed response rates were 32% with complete responses in 2.3% and partial responses in about a third of patients. The plot on the right is called a swimmer's plot, and it's a graphical way of showing how each patient's response, resp tumors responded to treatment over time. So each bar or lane is a patient, and then the length of the bar shows the time of response. And, and what we can glean from this plot is that the median duration of response for patients who were treated with erdofitinib was about five and a half months. And importantly, from this study, we learned that Patients who did not respond previously to immune checkpoint blockade indeed did respond to ertafitinib. The two main side effects we think about when um, dosing ertafitinib, among many others, are um, high phosphorus levels and eye disorders. So there is a pretty um, stringent requirement for frequent eye exams when first getting started on this medicine. And like with saxituzumab govotecan, there's also a confirmatory phase three study that's currently underway to confirm these findings. So in summary, we've discussed two new antibody drug conjugates today, infortumab vidotin and saxituzumab govotecan, as well as a small molecule targeted inhibitor called ertafitinib. These drugs are actively being tested in patients with earlier stages of bladder cancer and in combination with other drugs. And additionally, additionally, there are many new drugs on the horizon that are being tested. And I'm confident that we'll continue to see drug approvals for patients with bladder cancer in the advanced and metastatic uh, setting as we still have much work to do. So thank you all for coming today and listening and I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Holle. Wonderful presentation, and you really, really unpack so much data in a very efficient way. <laughs> so, so, so much uh, going on, right, in the, the field, and it's, it's really, really amazing to see the progress made. And the data you showed has been, the, you know, uh, the development of the last probably five years. So it's great to see this development in the field. Uh, in the interest of time, I will encourage uh, the audience to post questions in the chat room, and Dr. Holle can answer them. And I think this is the best uh, segue to the next uh, set of speakers. And I'm very, very excited and honored to introduce two wonderful colleagues, uh, Janet Hammond, who is a physician assistant at Seattle Cancer Care Alliance and a teaching associate at the University of Washington School of Medicine, 
as well as Teresa Winkler. She's an advanced registered nurse practitioner uh, and Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, and also a teaching associate in the University of Washington School of Medicine. I can tell you, uh, Teresa, Janet, and all our advanced practice providers working together are really, really essential in this our systematic team approach, how we take care of patients. And we have a wonderful day-to-day um, uh, -day communication on how to take care of patients together. Uh, Janet and Teresa will share with you some practical tips from their experience about the medications that uh, Dr. Holly presented to you uh, and also chemotherapy and immunotherapy. Janet and Teresa, thank you so much for joining. Great, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Grievous. I appreciate that. Um, Teresa, I don't know if we decided ahead of time who was gonna start first, mm -hmm. but, but I'm happy to, to dovetail after, after uh, Dr. Holly's talk. Go ahead. Okay, great, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm going to cover a little bit more uh, detail about some of the side effects of the, the medications that Dr. Holly was speaking about and how we approach managing those side effects and what other team members we get involved to help support patients through those, through those treatments. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of start with one of the first medications that Dr. Holly mentioned, which was Enfortimab, um, Bedotin. And again, just want to highlight that all of these drugs have been approved in the last three years. So like the number of treatments we have available now are, it's, it's wonderful that, that that's growing. And we all recognize we still have a ways to go with that for sure. Um, and Fortimab has been a great addition to our toolbox, if you will. It does have some side effects that, you know, need special attention, I think. Um, one of the main things I think about that comes up for patients initially is some of the GI toxicity. So poor appetite, it can affect weight and things like that. And so sometimes we need to work with patients to figure out what the best dose for them is. Sometimes that comes up kind of earlier in the conversation. Um, we often get nutrition involved as well to kind of help maximize how people are feeling while they're on the treatment. They can also have hair loss. And, you know, we have a group at Shine that can help with wig fittings and, and different things like that as well. Um, a couple of things I want to highlight. So this, the skin toxicity can be really variable. It can be very mild, you know, just requiring over-the-counter steroids, or it can be more significant where we're prescribing higher dose steroids or getting our derm colleagues involved. And sometimes it can be very serious, actually. That's rare, but it can be very serious where it, it, it presents with flu-like symptoms. You can have involvement um, of the oral mucosa and some other things. That's that's a more urgent situation. And we try to let people know that ahead of time so they know that they can connect with us if there's any concern about any rash. And it's pretty variable what we see in the clinic. So we, you know, we want to be available to patients as, as they need us for that. Um, the other thing I want to mention is the peripheral neuropathy because that can be really impactful for patients. You know, some of these patients have had prior chemotherapy, which can also contribute to neuropathy. And neuropathy can be one of those things that's challenging to treat and also can really impact function for patients. So usually it's um, people can get numbness or tingling in their hands or feet. Um, sometimes that can be painful. Uh, sometimes it impacts like ability to button or pick things up or feeling stable. So there's lots of things that we can do to help patients through that experience. Um, there are medications we can use for pain. Sometimes we, um, you know, involve our acupuncture colleagues, our physical therapy colleagues um, to help with some of those strengthening and balancing um, things and dealing with some of the, the actual numbness and tingling that can happen. But that's the most common reason for people to stop taking that medication is because of that toxicity. Um, that's mostly what I want to say about that drug. So I'll kind of switch gears and talk about the sasituzumab govotecan. And again, as Dr. Holly mentioned, the, the two main things we worry about are the GI toxicities, as well as the, um, the myelosuppression or the drop in white blood cells and red blood cells in particular that, that people can experience on that medication. So again, here we utilize our nutrition colleagues a lot to help deal with the poor appetite or change in appetite that can happen. There are lots of medications we can use to help manage both the nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Um, and then there are things that we can do to help augment white blood cells. Not everybody needs that, but there are medications that we can use to help support patients in that way as well. Um, and 
you know, I feel like I, I have been concentrating mostly on the physical aspects of this, the side effects, but I also just wanted to mention that we recognize that a diagnosis of cancer and the treatment of cancer can cause you know, it's an emotional challenge, mental emotional challenge for patients and their families. And we have lots of other supports in that way too. We have social work, chaplaincy, and um, psychiatry, psychology, who are also really helpful in supporting patients and their families through this. Um, and then the last piece I wanted to talk about is the ertafitinib. So ertafitinib is the only um, oral drug that we have available. And so um, it's also given continuously. That's another thing just to think about and can be taken at home clearly. As far as the side effects, um, there are these ocular toxicities. One is called uh, central serous retinopathy, and essentially it's some fluid building up in the eyes. And so we do have patients see ophthalmology up front and then every month for the first four months and then every three months after that. Those, if there are some toxicities, because sometimes they can be asymptomatic. Sometimes people will develop some blurry vision, but often it could be asymptomatic. So that screening with our ophthalmology colleagues is really important. Patients will also have what's called an Amsler grid at home. Um, and I, I guess I could go into more of that, but that's more important if you're actually on the medication, we, we would go through it at that time. But there are, there are ways for patients to kind of monitor at home as well. Um, and dry eyes can also be a challenge. So we often have patients use medications that can, you know, um, like artificial tears and things like that that can make it more comfortable. The, the phosphate, the elevated phosphate, um, phosphates in a lot of foods that are very commonly used. So we usually have patients meet with nutrition up front to talk about what a low phosphate diet really means. Um, and if that's still not hard, you know, sufficient to manage it, there are medications that we can use that are binders of phosphate. And then another thing that I've, I've seen be impactful for patients on this drug in particular, it's like hand foot syndrome. So people can get redness, swelling, pain in their hands and feet, which can really impact function for people. Um, sometimes, you know, inviting our dermatology colleagues to get involved can be helpful. And the other piece, and, and this, uh, this is more global as well, is that sometimes we have to interrupt the dosing or adjust the dosing to manage some of these toxicities. It's not always a matter of adding things, but really sort of finding the right dose or taking a break from medication is sometimes necessary for this. Um, so just kind of to summarize, you know, there's lots of, you know, these new drugs are really exciting. Um, they do have toxicities that can be challenging. And um, I think that as long as we're in communication, there are lots of ways that we can help support people through this and help them not only to, um, prevent toxicities or manage them and evaluate them, but also to optimize how they feel while they're getting treatment. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks for your time. So I'm here today to talk about chemotherapy and immunotherapy and um, some of the side effects and supportive things that we can do for patients while they're on these drugs. Um, so chemotherapy is usually administered on um, a two or three week cycle, patients usually require um, central access, so a port or pick line to help give these drugs, which can be pretty irritating to the veins and sometimes can cause some tissue damage. So we often ask for patients to get a central line for ease of administration and also because patients often have to come in weekly sometimes to get labs drawn. Um, with chemotherapy, um, because it suppresses the bone marrow, it often causes a lot of fatigue. Um, it can cause GI issues like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation. It can, because it suppresses the bone marrow, it can lower your white blood cell count and red blood cell count. And sometimes patients may need blood transfusions or platelet transfusions. Um, and similar to what Jeanette was talking about, we often give an injection to help stimulate the white blood cells on chemotherapy. Um, some of the other side effects of chemotherapy are similar to infortimab and sazituzumab where they cause neuropathy as well. Um, sometimes our chemotherapy regimens can cause hearing changes um, and hair loss. So there are a lot of ways that we can support patients you know, while going through these regimens. It's, which often last, um, you know, it can be about three months. 
Um, so we'll involve nutrition as well to help with weight loss and taste changes. Um, sometimes we involve the palliative care team to help us with symptom overall symptom management for patients on chemotherapy. Um, on immunotherapy, uh, I usually say that patients tend to feel a little bit better as far as fatigue because we don't, we're not suppressing the bone marrow, but we're stimulating the immune system to fight the cancer. Um, there can be fatigue with immunotherapy, but not as significant. And immunotherapy does not require central access. So patients can have a peripheral line placed every time they come in every two, three, or four weeks, and they don't need labs in between. Um, but sometimes um, patients already have central lines when, they're, when they get immunotherapy. Um, so with immunotherapy, because it does stimulate the immune system, it can cause inflammation in some of your organs, colitis, um, inflammation of your bowel, inflammation of your lungs, inflammation of your heart. It can cause skin or thyroid issues, um, sometimes muscle and joint aches. Um, and with all of the, we have resources to help manage these side effects. Um, a lot of times we do involve dermatology if we have significant rash issues. Um, and we also, you know, if patients end up having thyroid concerns, we'll have to give certain medications to help treat that. Um, but in, overall, um, you know, immunotherapy is a good drug. That's about all I have. Thank you so much, uh, Janet and Teresa. Uh, amazing wealth of information in a very efficient manner. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's so important to communicate all this, you know, with the patients as you do, you know, in a day to day practice. Maybe a very, very quick question to both of you. I know we're running out of time. Um, if you want to speak about the multidisciplinary care we have and how you perceive it, you know, from, from your role, we'll start with Janet and then Teresa can comment too. Thank you, both of you. Um, I guess, you know, my comment is just that it's so necessary really to help um, manage, like I said, manage toxicities, but also to, to really support patients through this whole process so that they can feel the best they can feel while they're going through treatment. And I feel really lucky in our institution that we have, we have so many great and accessible colleagues to work with in that regard. And even, you know, I don't know that I mentioned this so much, but even our integrative medicine group now to help with some of the mind-body techniques um, and acupuncture and, and really taking care of the the whole person. Um, I just think that that's a really um, satisfying part of the work and how we can really help people. I agree. I think we're very fortunate at UW and SCCA to have such a wealth of resources available to us and to the patients to help support them through their chemotherapy journey and tr cancer treatment journey. Totally agree, Janet and Teresa. Thank you so much for all you're doing every day for our patients. And uh, feel free to answer any questions in the chat room as they uh, pop up. It was a great uh, segue, actually, talking about multidisciplinary care and supportive measures, as you both mentioned. To introduce the next speaker, we're very excited to introduce Molly Arnold. Uh, uh, Molly Arnold is an uh, advanced registered nurse practitioner at Child Cancer Care Alliance. She's also a teaching associate at uh, University of Washington School of Medicine and has been partnering with us, uh, uh, taking care of patients. We serve many patients with Molly and we're very, very excited for this day-to-day uh, -day collaboration. Molly, thank you for joining. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, Dr. Grievous. I'm glad to be here and I'm glad to be part of this um, discussion today. The inclusion of palliative care is is important and it's a great segue um, from Jeanette and Teresa's discussion about symptom management and quality of life and um, it's a wonderful segment into palliative care. So I'll be brief, I know I know where I'm limited in time so I'll just share a few quick slides um, and then I will um, uh, open, open the floor up to questions here. Uh, I think if you're able to see them there. Great and um, palliative care. So this is a term that um, some people are familiar with and other patients are not as familiar with. Um, and so we usually start by uh, explaining that we're a team um, at SCCA that is part of um, your oncology team and the comprehensive um, team that you see at SCCA. And so as Jeanette and Teresa were talking about, um, we're an additional supportive care team, um, just like nutrition or 
um, uh, spiritual health or physical therapy is, we're also there. And our focus is really about, about quality of life for patients. Um, and so who am I? I'm one of the members of our palliative care team. We have um, uh, four nurse practitioners, a physician, several nurses. We're all working to support um, patients with palliative care um, while they're going through treatment. And we work alongside your oncology team. So just as Dr. Gravis was mentioning, we work with patients very closely. Sometimes we're in visits together um, and we go in and see patients and, and talk about um, how to help them, how to support them symptom management wise. Um, and other times we're seeing them individually uh, to, to work on, on how to optimize uh, side effect management. So what is palliative care? This is um, one of the biggest questions um, that we talk about with patients, and it's really specialized medical care for people that are living with a serious illness. Um, it's focused on providing relief of symptoms. So as um, a lot of the oncology team and, and supportive team we're talking about here, we really focus on a number of symptoms. That can be pain, it can be functional status, side effects from treatment. Um, we're really helping people and supporting them in managing that. Um, in addition to coping with this disease, we know what an impactful situation this is um, to the life of patients and families. And so we really spend a lot of time helping people manage the stress of their illness. The overall goal of palliative care is always to improve quality of life. And so we really try to provide individualized care to patients. Um, and it's not based on patient's prognosis. And we're always very clear about that. We can see patients at any point um, from the beginning of diagnosis all the way through. And oftentimes we're following patients for many years and supporting them through different treatments. Um, we're talking about decision-making when they have different treatments um, to decide on or to talk a little bit about when there's a change in a treatment plan. And we're there to support patients with the symptom management aspect of that, but also with the discussion about that. Um, our medicalized training helps us understand what treatment options are available and how we can support patients in that. Um, so we're really an additional layer of support we always talk about for patients. Um, and a lot of people ask me, when, when should I see palliative care? And it's really appropriate at any time, as I mentioned, um, from the time of diagnosis throughout your whole care trajectory, we're here to support patients and family members. And um, our patients are really find that having an additional team to talk about some of these medical decisions and the symptom management aspect really help people process the information it helps them feel that they get a better handle on the symptom management piece of things. Oftentimes we're spending a lot of time with patients about pain, nausea, these peripheral neuropathies that Jeanette and Teresa were mentioning, um, functional status that Dr. Sipko was talking about. We're really there to help try to support and optimize those things. And we can spend additional time on that. We know that your oncology visits are focused on treatment and decision-making and that time can go very quickly. And so we're here to help um, support them in other ways. There's a lot of evidence that I share with patients about um, why, why the inclusion of palliative care makes a difference. Um, you know, there's a New England Journal of uh, Medicine article, there's ASCO posts and conversations about this. We really are there. They've found that the inclusion of palliative care, especially early on, can be so helpful in optimizing um, how, how patients do with this experience. One distinction I always like to make for people is that um, occasionally people confuse palliative care with hospice, and those terms were used um, synonymously many, many decades ago. And so we've really tried to provide a lot of education around the difference in palliative care. And so we share that we are not hospice care. Um, hospice care is, is provided to patients um, at the time that they need that care, and that's provided in a home setting at the last six months of life or so. But palliative care is much more upstream than that. As Dr. Grievous was mentioning, we share many patients, and we've been following along um, from the beginning of diagnosis for people um, to help help focus on the quality of life. So we're here and um, there's many ways that you can be referred to palliative care. Um, the best thing to do is talk with your oncologist about this, talk with your nurse practitioner, your provider, a radiation oncologist, and they can talk to you about um, if they feel that that, that is an appropriate um, service for you. We are appropriate for almost everybody. Um, you can also self-refer. Um, and I'm sharing a phone number on here and um, I can share an email address with everybody as well. You're welcome to reach out to us. My nurses do a wonderful job of talking to patients about what is the best time for palliative care? How do I get involved? How can we be part of your team to help you? And we're happy to talk more um, on an individualized level about how we might be impactful in your care as well. So, um, so thank you. Um, I know that we're brief on time, so we appreciate the opportunity to introduce palliative care and our inclusion in your, in your team. 
Well, we appreciate you being here because it is such an integral part of the care of, the, of our patients and an area we're certainly trying to get more and more of our patients engaged. So we appreciate your partnership. We can keep doing um, questions in the chat. Uh, we do have uh, a spot for a little bit of a break, but we could just keep on moving through too. I'm kind of inclined just to keep on moving in the interest of time. Everyone can hop up and sneak away to the restroom if needed. So I'm going to go ahead and just uh, decide to keep on going going forward. So we're going to take a we're going to switch a little bit and uh, really bring back in the concept of research that's been intermingled throughout the various talks and just highlight some of the important research that's being done here uh, by our team members. Uh, and, uh, and and as Petros Grievous said earlier, research involves all of our patients. So you are a partner in this as well too. So to, to lead us off is Dr. Uh, John Lee. John Lee is a, uh, uh, is, a, is a medical oncologist and also a researcher as well. He has an extensive lab that he has over at the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center. It has been just awesome to have, uh, but just to be around this guy. Uh, and and, and, and it, I, I will let him share some of the incredible stuff he's working on. Um, and just as a as a as a pitch, you know, we're going to be hearing a little bit from the Beacon organization, and 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 Dr. Lee has been very involved with them too, and, and especially coming their the upcoming uh, national meeting they're having. So uh, with that, Dr. Lee, take it away. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for the introduction, and uh, it's really a pleasure to be able to share some of our research uh, today. Um, let me get my slides here. All right, can you uh, see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the work that's ongoing in my lab. Um, and we're focused on understanding the biology of bladder cancer through disease modeling, uh, and then to, the, to develop next generation immunotherapies to develop better approaches to treat bladder cancer. Um, so one thing I wanted to really reinforce is that bladder cancer is quite heterogeneous um, and it's heterogeneous on multiple levels. Um, so cancer is a disease of uh, abnormalities in DNA. And I think of DNA as sort of providing the instructions of life. Uh, and when DNA becomes deranged, that's when cancer emerges. And so over the last uh, decade or so, we've had uh, some improvements in technologies that actually allow us to read through all of the DNA in tumors and to look for these derangements or gene mutations that occur uh, that are associated with cancer. And so this is just a, a plot and um, across the top are essentially in individual tumors um, that were sequenced. And across uh, the bottom here, um, along the y-axis are genes that are mutated recurrently in bladder cancers. And so I, I don't want you to focus too much on this because it's quite complicated, but the, really the message is that no two tumors are alike in that each tumor um, is independent in terms of the number and types of mutations that are actually present within each tumor. And so at the level of DNA, there's complexity. And then when we think about the behaviors of these tumors, um, we can look at other molecular features and lump these tumors into a variety of different classifications. And even when a pathologist looks under the microscope, you can see that not all bladder cancers are alike. You know, the most common type of bladder cancer is urethelial carcinoma, but there are also variants that can be mixed in with urethelial carcinoma, or some of these variants can actually be dominant uh, within the tumors. And these include things like plasma cytoid carcinoma, sarcomatoid carcinoma, small cell, and others. And so we've asked in the lab, you know, how do we better model the complexity of the human disease in laboratory models? And the reason we ask this is that we want to understand what's the connection between all of these different um, genetic derangements that we see in human patients, and how does that really affect the, the biology of the disease, and how individual tumors will respond to different tumors, or, sorry, different treatments, or become um, resistant to these treatments. And so our underlying thought was that really with the technologies that we've had in the laboratory over the last couple of decades, only a few gene abnormalities have been studied simultaneously with available technologies. And, and because we can only study a few of these genetic abnormalities at a time, 
this probably leads to an underrepresentation of the diversity of the human disease. And so we wanted to increase our ability to look at more of these gene abnormalities together and in a more rapid way. So higher order, higher throughput investigation. And we thought that that might unleash the diversity of human bladder cancer. And, and if we could do that, then we'd gain a better understanding of how these various diseases arise and how um, these diseases either are resistant or responsive to different therapies. So our general approach was this, we, we cataloged a number of these gene mutations and made a library of them. And we start with bladder cells, normal bladder cells, and we've devised a way to be able to deliver these genetic abnormalities into these cells at random um, and in various mixtures. And the idea is that only a subset of these mixtures of genetic abnormalities will have sufficient signals to actually initiate cancer. And then we could use available technologies to figure out how these genes can cooperate to initiate these various types of uh, bladder cancer and to learn more about how these genes interact in that process. Um, and in so doing, we've been able to generate many different models of bladder cancer that are much more complex um, than the models that had been available previously. This is just one example of a tumor. Um, and a trained pathologist uh, has looked at this and essentially you can identify three distinct regions of this tumor. And when you look deeper into the microscope uh, at higher resolution, you can actually see that these are very different uh, types of bladder cancer that emerge. And these are actually clinically relevant in that one area shows urethelial carcinoma with squamous differentiation. Another shows sort of a lower grade papillary carcinoma. And then this last region shows a very high grade sarcomatoid carcinoma. And so many of these we haven't been previously able to model um, in mouse models, uh, as I described. Um, and so these are actually very new models of disease um, that are only available because of uh, the development of this technology. But importantly, we've been able to define, you know, what are the gene abnormalities um, that exist within these three different regions? And this will allow us to really investigate how these gene abnormalities uh, induce these different subtypes of bladder cancer. And so this is just a list of the diversity of models that we've been able to generate thus far. Um, and so uh, without going through all of these, we, we see typical high-grade urethelial carcinomas, low-grade urethelial carcinomas, we're able to generate squamous cell carcinomas, sarcomatoid carcinomas, and, and a number of different uh, uh, histologies, which uh, previously you haven't been able to do. So we're very excited about our development of these new models, which hopefully will provide us additional insight into the biology of the disease. I want to turn now to uh, some of the work that we're doing in immunotherapy, and particularly in the uh, area of adoptive transfer of genetically modified cells. Um, to go over this diagram, one approach that we take is to remove uh, immune cells uh, from the patient through leukapheresis. Um, and then we can take these cells, um, activate them, and modify them in the lab so that they're reprogrammed um, to attack this particular feature of cancer. Um, and after these have been reprogrammed, we can actually expand them to generate an army. Um, and then after treating the patient with chemotherapy to make space, we're able to return these cells back into the patient with the idea that these cells would then wage war on the cancer in the body. Um, and so this type of technology or one type of technology is called chimeric antigen receptor therapy. And what a chimeric antigen receptor is, it's an engineered protein um, that has one end that is able to identify a particular feature of a tumor cell. And then within the cell, once this, uh, this end has engaged the tumor cell, um, there are signaling domains that activate the immune cell um, to do what it does best, which is to actually kill uh, the tumor cell. Um, and so it really leverages specificity um, and then also the potency of the immune system However, we really need to make sure that whatever we're targeting, whatever feature uh, is present on a tumor cell um, is only present on the tumor cell and not expressed highly on vital organs. Because again, uh, these professional uh, immune cells are very potent and uh, they can in fact cause uh, toxicity in normal tissues as well. So this type of technology um, is approved now for a variety of indications in cancer, uh, primarily in uh, blood cancers like leukemias, lymphomas, and myelomas. But we are starting to see fairly impressive uh, early responses reported from clinical trials in solid tumors. And just to show you sort of the potency of this technology, um, these are PET scans on the right from a patient with multiple myeloma. And so these black spots that you see uh, scattered across the body are all um, areas of disease. 
Um, and so this is a before image, and this is after uh, a CAR T cell therapy to multiple myeloma called a BCMA CAR T cell therapy. And you can see that all of these spots, uh, especially along the arms, um, in the hips, um, and in the legs have essentially disappeared. And so I just wanted to share with you some of the work that uh, we've been doing in the lab. Um, and uh, one of the targets that we've been looking at is uh, Nectin-4. Um, and as you've, as you've heard from uh, prior talks, uh, there was a drug, uh, antibody drug conjugate called Enfortimab Vidotin um, that was developed against Nectin-4. Uh, and Nectin-4 is a very good target in bladder cancer because it's highly expressed. Um, and uh, this has been uh, borne out in a variety of clinical trials previously. And so we have developed a chimeric antigen receptor against Nectin-4 um, and have been able to engineer T cells in a way where uh, when we mix these CAR T cell therapy, this CAR T cell therapy with bladder cancer cells, we can see that these cells get activated. And then the impressive videos on the right essentially show you mixtures of, of these varieties of T cells uh, with bladder cancer cells. And I want to direct your attention to the bottom right. Um, and what you see in the bottom right is that um, these green cells are all the tumor cells. Um, and only in the condition where you introduce the nectin 4 CAR T cells with the bladder cancer cells do you see that these green cells actually are controlled and, and even killed. And so that's really um, evidence of the potency of this technology. Another type of CAR T cell therapy that uh, we've been developing um, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Holly is uh, targeted against another antigen called STEEP1. And we know that STEEP1 is uh, highly expressed in prostate cancer, bladder cancer, and Ewing sarcoma. We generated quite a bit of data. I'm just gonna show you some data from Ewing sarcoma models uh, where uh, in the culture dish, you can see that um, these CAR T cells targeted at STEEP1 uh, really do a good job of killing off of these tumor cells. Um, but more impressively, when we go into mice, what we see is that when we establish these tumors uh, in the legs of these mice and we introduce um, these CAR T cells, um, what you're seeing is this uh, red signal indicates not only the presence, but the intensity of, of uh, the tumor burden. And you can clearly see that when we introduce the CAR T cells, um, that that tumor burden regresses quite significantly, whereas those, cell, those, those mice that receive uh, control CAR uh, T cells, uh, they are all dead by about uh, three weeks. So one of the major focuses in applying CAR T cells to bladder cancer is not, not only to treat advanced disease, but one, one area that we're very interested in here in Seattle is to develop new ways to uh, deliver intravesically CAR T cells uh, for localized disease. And there are several reasons why. I think one is that there's a national shortage of BCG. Um, there's certainly a clinical need for additional bladder sparing approaches. Um, cystoscopy and intravesical therapy are already standard practices. And then multiple immunotherapies are already approved for bladder cancer therapy. And as I've shown you, CAR Ts really do have tremendous anti-tumor activity. Um, and you have heard about some of the toxicities of some of these therapies that are delivered intravenously. What we know about CAR T cells is that uh, local delivery can overcome some of these toxicities that could, could, could occur with uh, intravenous administration. So we're really focused on this approach and uh, hopefully within the next couple of months, we should have some data. Uh, so please stay tuned. Um, and so I'd like to stop by uh, and end here by acknowledging members of my lab, as well as uh, others within the, the bladder cancer group here at uh, the University of Washington, Fred Hutch and Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. Thank you very much. Yeah, that is, it is so exciting to see. Uh, that's just incredible work. So it's in, and clearly more to come uh, uh, in, in, in the future here. So I um, uh, can't say enough. Thanks, Dr. Lee. I'm gonna also now have uh, Dr. Ming Lam speak. So Dr. Lam uh, is the uh, chief um, PhD researcher in our bladder, in the University of Washington uh, Bladder Cancer Lab. Uh, she's been a partner with us for many years now, and she is going to talk today really about the, you know, the patient impact uh, that you have on bladder cancer researchers. Her team up in the lab actually spends so much time down in the clinic, and many of you have met her team, uh, and I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Lamb. So thank you for having me. So uh, today I'm going to discuss the uh, patient's impact on bladder cancer research. Actually, yeah, as uh, Dr. Rice has mentioned, we are really behind the scenes person. So we 
process this specimen and trying to understand how the patient's disease is happening in the patient. And then we are trying to uh, model it, like as Dr. Lee has mentioned, model it in the lab and try to bring the discovery back to the patient. So for our biospecimen acquisition, we basically split it into two parts. One is for the earlier disease, which we uh, acquire biospecimens from the operating room, which reflects the uh, majority of the histology, rheophilial, and some of the very rare but aggressive variants, including the plasmocytoid squamous, as uh, Dr. Lee has mentioned. So what we do in the lab is we uh, collect the specimen and then we run back and with a pathology guidance, help us to dissect the tumor area, et cetera. Then we were able to uh, store it in a minus 80 degree freezer for our genomic analysis. And then we were able to construct a tissue microarray, which basically, if you can see here, is every single dot can be a patient. So from here, we have like basically 60 patients specimen in here to provide us valuable resource to identify biomarkers within this patient and see the heterogeneity of each tumor. So for the um, early disease, we did uh, uh, collect specimens from the operating room. And for more advanced disease, we established this uh, bladder cancer rapid autopsy program seven years ago. So why we need to establish this program is that it's very, very challenging to obtain enough specimen from a traditional biopsy to study metastatic disease. Not to mention the biopsy is too small. It's way too small for us to do any meaningful um, molecular analysis on the tumor. So uh, we established this uh, autopsy program, and uh, I'm happy to say that this is uh, this program is among the uh, nation is one of the most active program right now to collect bladder cancer from patients, focusing on metastatic disease, and we are the only institution that incorporates simultaneous metastatic specimen collection, and implant this metastatic specimen directly into mouse. So the mouse can carry the tumor for the patient for therapeutic testing. So for biospecimen acquisition from the autopsy, every single patient will fill out this extensive packet, which consists of 18 pages in the middle of the night usually. So uh, to make sure we have the checklist, every single point check, all the metastatic tissues collect so that for us to have a really deep survey on the tissue that is impacting uh, the tumor that is impacting the patient. So for the biospecimen for this uh, rapid autopsy program so far, we have uh, performed 23 autopsy to date, and we collect more than 400 specimens, including tumor and matched normal tissues, as well as cell-free DNA and urine if there's available. So for metastatic sites that we collect, for example, this is a very uh, snapshot regarding the uh, sites that we collect for each patient. For well, here is one patient. This a uh, particular patient has liver metastasis. Each color represents one metastatic site that we collect. So this patient has liver metastasis with lung metastasis and some bone metastasis. So we collect all of them so that we can study every single metastasis. And in some patients, you see rainbow color, which means there's multiple organ site involvement in this metastatic disease. So from here, not only we uh, study the patient tumor, we also select some of the most viable tumor and implant into the mouse to develop patient-derived sinographs. So for patient-derived sinograph, it is actually the, as I mentioned, we take a metastatic site from the tumor, uh, from the patient, and directly run into the animal facility and implant into the immunocompromised mouse that is basically waiting there. So this is in partnership with uh, Cohen Foundation of uh, Cancer of the Black, uh, Cohen Foundation. That's why we name it as CoCap series. So what happened after the tumor established in the mouse is that now the mouse is basically carrying the tumor for the patient. We subject the patient tumor and the mouse tumor for sequencing. Now we get the sequencing report to make sure the mouse is actually having the tumor with the exact same genetic aberration that the patient has. And now we are confident that this mouse is carrying the patient's tumor. And now we can use this mouse for therapeutic testing for the patient. So far we have developed 
10 patients derived syndrome for bladder cancer patients. This, we're very excited to see the first uh, patient derived syndrome model that is derived from the very aggressive bladder cancer metastasis that actually representing the metastatic disease. So for the patient derived syndrome, very important thing is I, I mentioned they really reflect the uh, tumor from the patient, not only molecularly, but also in the histology. So in the patient, there's the uh, tumor under the microscope. The blue is every single blue dot is one uh, bladder cancer cell. So from here, this is how it looks like in the patient tumor. And the down bottom is how it looks like in the patient derived sinograph, meaning the tumor in the mouse. So basically, if you can appreciate under the microscope, they look very similar. Even in histological uh, differentiation, like this squamous differentiation, you see the pearl in the patient and see the same pearl in the patient derived sinograph. So this gives give us confidence in terms of using the patient derived sinograph in mimicking the clinical situation in the patient. Then we subject uh, all these patient specimen, all the metastasis to next generation multi-omics uh, discovery to delineate the genetic drivers for the metastasis. Then the take home message for this type of multi-omics discovery is that after uh, we, uh, we published this uh, observation a couple of years ago, is that in the autopsy cases, although the patient died of bladder cancer at that time, actually in the metastasis that they are having in the body, they still have actionable mutations that can be potentially targeted by existing drugs that were not approved for bladder cancer yet. So for example, on this bladder cancer patient, he died in 2015. At that time, aritifinib, which is the FGFR inhibitor that uh, has presented earlier. So this is a recently newly approved target therapy for bladder cancer. But unfortunately, he has a mutation that is, could be eligible for this particular target therapy. But uh, at that time, this therapy is not approved yet. And same for uh, bladder cancer patient two and three, they have actionable targets, but these targets are not yet approved for bladder cancer. And how about the brand new FDA approved therapeutic target antibody drug conjugate that we just mentioned before, is that in, even in these heavily treated relapsed bladder cancer cases at autopsy, here one blue cell is the uh, one bladder cancer cell, here shows negative protein expression. But very surprisingly, we see both targets to Nectin-4 and TROP2, which are the drug to Enfortumab and Cesarezumab. Both of them are highly expressed in the uh, bladder cancer cases. Bladder cancer metastasis that uh, we collect at the autopsy. So the take home message here is that we still are very hopeful and see that through this autopsy program, we were able to identify new therapeutic targets for this patient who really need more therapies. So our vision for bladder cancer is that patients really advance bladder cancer research. This is a true partnership. So we uh, established this partnership by building the clinical specimen program for global access to advanced bladder cancer research. And we also develop multi-omics sequencing to define metastatic bladder cancer landscape for therapeutic discovery. But for the interest of time, I'm not going to go into my research detail because I'm really focusing on treating the tumor and it's microenvironment alone, because I'm a big supporter of that. The tumor itself cannot really survive really well in a metastatic stage, which is a foreign microenvironment. So we need to sort of like having a multi-target approach in order to disrupt the microenvironment so that the tumor itself is not, like basically is not happy and not growing in the foreign environment. So thank you. And I'm going to take any questions at the end. Thank you so much, Ming. Wonderful talk. So exciting to see this research unfolding. Both you and John have done a wonderful job working with us. And thank you for all the behind the scenes and uh, in front of the scenes work that you're doing uh, in our trials, in our translation research program. Talking about translation, I will uh, um, ask again the audience to uh, post questions in the chat room. And uh, uh, Ming, you can uh, uh, answer them with your expertise. And I will uh, transition actually to from the laboratory to the clinic. Uh, and I think that's excitement in our program here. Uh, and uh, of course, the uh, opportunity 
to translate these ideas generated in the lab to clinical research, clinical trials, and taking care of our patients. And uh, I want to check, uh, Jonathan, can you see my slides okay? Perfect. So uh, I'll uh, go ahead quickly and just want to give you just some snapshot examples of what is the importance of clinical application of clinical research. Uh, John and Ming talked to you about the importance of working in the lab to evaluate ideas, concepts, and again, the ultimate goal is to translate those to uh, innovative pace and get access to care and creating more therapies. So if you think about early stage bladder cancer, what we discussed before with uh, Dr. Uh, Gore, uh, Dr. Galli, Dr. Kirk, and others, uh, this is a, what we call superficial bladder cancer. And in order to facilitate enable drug development, uh, we have collaborations with the FDA, the National Cancer Institute, of course, other academic centers, patient advocacy group like Beacon, and uh, Stephanie will talk to you about that in a second, Howard Cohen Foundation. And all of these stakeholders can sit in a room and define what we call a landscape, right? What are the unmet needs for patients with non-muscle basic bladder cancer? And based on the intravesical BCG that Dr. Gall talked to you about, how do we define patients who never got BCG or received BCG in, inside the bladder, but the cancer came back? Uh, and depending on the timing of coming back, we define these treatment settings, as we say, and we develop a framework uh, that, you know, this has been published, that we define what is the population in need, what are the needs of those patients, as Dr. Gore mentioned before, and how do we find metrics of success, right? How do we say, if we treat a drug A or B, uh, many examples, how do we define that this drug is valuable, adding value to the patient? And that framework is very important for drug development because if we say, you know, we need a response rate, right? The uh, rate of, of cancer shrinking by X percent. Are we meeting that metric in the clinical trial in order to have the FDA review that and potentially give FDA approval? So this example I gave you led to the approval of pembrolizumab, an, an immunotherapy drug in non muscle based bladder cancer. Just an example of how you can achieve uh, a, an approval by the FDA by working together in teams with different stakeholders. And pembrolizumab is an option for, for some of the patients in this setting. The, the other important point I think that uh, we discussed before is that patients who decide to go on uh, the pathway of removing their bladder, radical cystectomy, uh, they ideally, if it's possible, depending on other medical conditions, receive cisplatin-based chemotherapy. And we have two regimens, including cisplatin, before surgery. So the question is, how can we optimize delivery of that? And Dr. Niyame discussed that before. We want to increase uh, the number of patients who get spinal based chemotherapy if it's a good option for that patient based on other medical conditions. But about half of our patients you know, have other conditions that do not allow uh, use of cisplatin. So the question is, how do we develop innovative therapies? And I saw a question in the chat room about the use of checkpoint inhibitors, right, as discussed by Jeanette, uh, by uh, Teresa, and by Jessica, uh, is discussing what is the role of checkpoint inhibition in metastatic disease. And now we're going further earlier, and we discussed how can we um, evaluate these checkpoint inhibitors uh, in patients who are about to get radical cystectomy uh, uh, for bladder cancer. And we did a clinical trial here with uh, our teamwork, and we evaluated this drug called nivolumab, which is immunotherapy drug, activating the immune system and leasing the immune system against the cancer. And we tried to evaluate that value of this drug along with another immunotherapy. And we tried to see whether, what is the, the uh, chance, ability of these drugs treating the cancer and you know, making the cancer disappear after surgery. And there are many examples of those clinical trials evaluating the role of immunotherapy before surgery, as well as after surgery, in addition to what we discussed before about metastatic disease. And uh, we have been able to you know, complete those studies like that, presented at the national forums, and now writing the publications coming out of that, aiming again to, to inform discussions about drug development. And one of that, there are many examples of that, what we call a phase three trial, which is evaluating different immunotherapies for patients who cannot receive this cisplatin chemotherapy for surgery, and we offer them the chance to go on a trial looking at the combination of immunotherapy or a single agent immunotherapy or no immunotherapy to see if immunotherapy as single agent or a combination adds value if, if it's given before and after surgery. So there are many other examples, of course, as I saw in this slide, and this is just one uh, to illustrate how we go about drug development, right? And try to optimize outcomes, survival of patients uh, by using immunotherapy earlier. So far, as discussed before, 
the immunotherapy is experimental in, in the before the surgery setting. But there's data suggesting that after surgery, uh, uh, it might have a role. The other quick point I want to make is regarding what we discussed before us, variant histologies. And I think Dr. John and uh, Mink uh, discussed that, that that's a focus of our program. These are uh, uh, histologies, the way that cancer looks under the microscope that is not uh, the classical flavor of urothelial cancer has a different appearance. And we have an interest how to improve outcomes in those di more difficult to treat variants of bladder cancer. And we have a, uh, a couple of clinical trials. We have uh, mentees working with us. This is an example of a trial looking at the combination of chemotherapy and immunotherapy together to try to address uh, uh, you know, the challenge of variant histology for patients with localized bladder cancer before they go to surgery. And this is another trial by our, our, another mentee of ours. The previous was Dr. Kaki. Here is Dr. Kalukder. He's a fellow here. And we're looking at this drug that uh, Dr. Holly mentioned, the satisfaction of uh, and uh, uh, also, uh, uh, you know, we, we try to develop uh, other drugs too. But this particular agent uh, is uh, aiming to cancer uh, cell killing in the bladder before uh, patients get radical cystectomy removal of the bladder. And this is for patients who, because of other medical conditions, cannot receive cisplatin chemotherapy. So we have a program evaluating all these drugs that we discussed before in metastatic disease and try to move them earlier to see if they add value in earlier disease settings. After surgery, there's a lot of discussion. Some patients may benefit from chemotherapy if they never received chemotherapy before, before the surgery in the neoadjuvant setting. And we have a, a way to discuss with the patient pros and cons about selection, who needs chemotherapy, who does not. And in addition to that, we have exciting clinical trials evaluating immunotherapy after surgery. There is already a, a drug approved called nivolumab for some patients, but we're evaluating other drugs like pembrolizumab, this trial is ongoing, as well as targeted therapies. As uh, we did heard before from Jeanette, Teresa, and Jessica, we have uh, this FGF receptor inhibitor called erdafitinib from metastatic urothelial cancer. We we're looking at a similar drug, not the same, but similar after surgery to see if we can prevent cancer from coming back if the, if the tumor, the cancer has a particular mutation uh, in the DNA level. So we're doing these trials and we're trying to offer them uh, for our patients. Uh, Dr. Yao, uh, Jay, uh, before he discussed about this bladder preservation approach that we offer to a, a particular number of patients who are a good fit for that. And we're evaluating the addition of immunotherapy to the backbone of chemotherapy and radiation, see whether immunotherapy can add value in this aim of bladder preservation. And actually, Stephanie uh, Chisholm from Beacon will discuss with you before we uh, later, we have actually uh, a dedicated session for a bladder cancer focus network meeting coming this summer, discussing bladder preservation and similar trials like this one. And to conclude my talk here uh, and move to the next session, I want to just outline in one slide that there have been so many advances in the field of urothelial cancer, uh, especially in the metastatic disease setting when the cancer spreads. Over the last uh, uh, five years, we have had eight new drugs approved and more than 10 indications, which is amazing to see and experience after almost three decades of stagnancy of this disease. And this is a direct result of number one, more awareness, Number two, uh, more uh, funding in bladder cancer, understanding of the biology, as we heard from Mink and John, and translating these uh, understandings into clinical research and clinical trials. Clinical trials is the way to move forward, how we make this slide happen, how we add more agents in our armamentarium and help our patients benefit from, from those agents we heard today. There's many more coming down the pike, many more trials. And of course, we look back in our, the medical record and we have a number of mentees here uh, you see the pictures in the slide, looking at the, uh, uh, going back in time and see patients who receive, for example, immunotherapy for metastatic urothelial cancer, what happened to those patients? How can we leverage this data to inform future clinical trials? So we have a team approach and of course, mentoring, you know, the next generation, you know, of very, very amazing rising stars. So I'll stop here. It's exciting to see the revolution in the field of uh, bladder cancer and overall urothelial cancer. Uh, we're very excited, but we're also optimistic for the future for more individualized therapies. How can we identify the right patient for the right uh, uh, patient for the right time? And we're working in that direction in the future. I'll um, move on here, um, and uh, I will uh, uh, continue this uh, pace of uh, 
collaboration. I just alluded to my talk a few seconds ago about the important, wonderful role that the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network plays in raising awareness about this uh, uh, disease and how we can help our patients. Uh, I can go on and on talking about that, but I want to introduce Stephanie Chisholm, who is here today. She's a director of education and research for the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network, a great partner along the years and uh, a great collaborator. Stephanie, the floor is yours. Thank you for all you're doing and for being here today. Thank you so much, Dr. Grievous and Dr. Wright. It really is a pleasure. So if you'll let me share my screen, um, I will hold on one second and put my screen up because what I thought would be a good idea over the next couple of minutes is to just give you a sense. I think you understand better now that there's amazing work that's being done in the Seattle area with a phenomenal group of doctors. But anybody who's got a bladder cancer diagnosis, regardless of whether you've had it for a while and you're a survivor or not, it's still a scary thing and people don't always know. And I really wanted to stress that there are a lot of resources and essentially because everything is available to you online, there are resources that are available 24 hours a day. And if you visit us, you'll find everything that you probably need to help better understand your disease. So Beacon, started in 2005, is here to provide education and support to the patient community, to advocate on behalf of bladder cancer patients, to support the research. As Dr. Grievous mentioned, we have a, a scientific meeting every summer. And we also, last year, provided over $850,000 in research funding, including to Dr. Lee to support some of his research, which is really exciting. And then in May, we have Bladder Cancer Awareness Month because we really wanna be sure that no patient learns about bladder cancer at their diagnosis. We want people to know that it's there, it exists. And yes, you can live with bladder cancer. It may be different, but you can definitely have a quality of life, especially because of the phenomenal doctors in Seattle. So we're here to help walk through with patients and families on their bladder cancer journey. We give answers, we provide support and hope. And if you visit our website, bcan.org, that's where everything is housed. On there, you can find a free copy of Bladder Cancer Basics, as well as our tips for caregivers. You can request a phone conversation with somebody who's gone through a similar treatment to what you're about to go through so you can understand what questions they wish they had known before. There are many videos, including quite a few by the team in Seattle that are on our expert videos tab on our website. We've actually added a new classification of online programming called Treatment Talks, which feature an expert talking about a classification of a treatment along with patients who want to know and share what they wish they had known or how they managed any challenges and complications. We have a new Bladder Cancer Matters podcast, which features host Rick Banks, and he is the proud owner of a... Um, what is it, 2006 model neobladder, as he says at the beginning of every episode, where he interviews key research and clinical experts to talk about pertinent bladder cancer issues. And one of the things that's on our dashboard that everybody has talked about today is a clinical trials dashboard, where you can search for clinical trials in your area, whether it's in the Washington area, or perhaps you're zooming in from some other part of the United States, we have all the open clinical trials that are currently recruiting patients in the state and in the United States, including the CISTO study that Dr. Gore referred to. One of the newest features we just added to our website, because I think a lot of people feel like they're the only one that have ever been diagnosed with bladder cancer, is a state map, which identifies in Washington state and every other state how many people do we expect to get bladder cancer every year? And gives you tools for advocating and also resources. So you could find the National Cancer Institute and NCC and National Comprehensive Cancer Network hospitals near you, as well as VA centers, and then have tools for advocating and finding out more about local resources through the Department of Health. So you can check on your state. 
And as I mentioned earlier, we do support research and we're very, very honored to be working with all the doctors there. Many of them are on our scientific review group and Dr. Grievous is chairing a group for us as well. So we really appreciate their attention to that. But as I said, I'd love for everybody to visit bcan.org. It's your first stop and it's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And don't forget, to, jo to join and sign up on the team for the Seattle Cancer Care, Fred Hutch. I'm not sure which one you have. You have a bunch of different teams going on out there in Seattle, but the May Walk to End Bladder Cancer is coming to Seattle on May the 7th, I believe. So you can get more information if you visit bcanwalk.org or shoot us an email at walkatbeacon.org for more information. And then also be sure that you keep an eye out for an invitation to come to Baltimore for our Bladder Cancer Summit for Patients and Families. It's going to occur the 30th of September and 1st of October this year. We're keeping our fingers crossed that it'll be good and safe for everybody to travel and be together because there's a, a lot to be said for being in a room full of people who know exactly what you're dealing with. And that's what we're hoping for come this October. And I'm just providing my email in case you have any questions, please drop me an email. If you want more information about anything I mentioned, this is the easiest way to reach me. So thanks so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to share and to partner on this program. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Such a wonderful experience to work with you, all of us here. I know Dr. Wright created a team here for our Bladder Cancer Focus Network work. And uh, that's my first task today after this event is to join his team and uh, you know spread the word. Uh, I think it's a good opportunity to raise awareness and build a coalition right, uh, against bladder cancer. We want to treat and cure as many patients as we can and improve quality of life. And since bladder cancer, uh, you know, it's so common uh, and has many causes, and Stephanie will welcome you to answer any questions as they appear in the chat room. Um, since bladder cancer has many causes, you know, we heard from Dr. Kerk about environmental factors uh, and a very, very nice talk. We also have this question, is any genetic predisposition for bladder cancer or any other urothelial cancer in the urinary tract? And we know more and more these days about potential genetic predisposition that the more we know, the more we can help our patients and inform their families about that. And to discuss this very, very important topic, and I would say expanding topic, we have, we're very, very uh, uh, honored and uh, very excited to have uh, Dr. Marianne Dubar-Gold. Uh, Dr. Dubar-Gold is a medical director of Cancer Genetics Program at Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. She's an assistant professor at the University of Washington. And we're very, very pleased that uh, she joined us, uh, I think a couple of years ago, Marianne. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much for joining for all your work. Can you hear me okay, Dr. Grievous? Thank you. And I'm gonna share my screen as we go along. I hope this is gonna work out. Do you see the screen with the slides? Coming on or not? Yes, yes we see them. Still, you see the, the slides on the site? Okay. All right, so thank you very much for having me uh, uh, join today. This is really a, a brief um, conversation to share a little bit more around how we use genetic information uh, for helping your doctors uh, care for your cancer yourself and your family. And so uh, briefly, the things that I'll cover, and really this is just a, a brief overview because you've had and you've heard a lot about this already, are the types of genetic testing, the, uh, the genetic testing we use specifically for bladder and urethelial cancer, and then the results and significance of these um, uh, findings that we have. But First and foremost, uh, you know, you know, the, really the, the main point today is that the genetic evaluation you can have would be very useful uh, for your doctors to be able to take a look at your DNA, and we'll talk about how we do that to help you with the cancer treatments or the options that you have in front of you, and and also help your family later on. Uh, and I, I can't agree more with this uh, Times cover because it is the greatest invention. <laughs> uh, but really, how and what is what is a genetic test and what, how do we use that? So we really go all the way down to the things you've heard already about the, the cells we have in our body. And those cells, we basically go all the way deep down to look at their, the makeup inside and the DNA that's inside to be able to draw some conclusions in terms of how the cancer got there and how we can use 
the information to tailor the treatment or the interventions. There are many, many different types of uh, genetic testing you can have. We can look at the DNA. We can look at the downstream targets of the DNA. We can uh, utilize your blood, your saliva, your nails even. Actually, interestingly, we can test your nails, uh, skin tissues, and tumor tissue. And that's, I think, the most important for the targeted therapy because we could literally take a piece of the tumor that's on the slide and send it off for testing and come up with some results that would guide the treatments. Um, how can we tell the difference between what is in the tumor and what's in your whole genetic makeup of your whole body? We know cancer is a genetic process overall because mutations accumulate. And if there are no mechanisms to take care of this little cell with horns, uh, the cell will go on to create a cancer eventually. But not all cancers are inherited, meaning that they were not there in the first place and got along for a ride, but they uh, um, kind of grew out of this one cell. And, and really having this information is very useful to decide how we go about treating your tumor, yourself, and your family downstream, if that's something we identify. And so the types of genetic testing, again, we can use the genetic evaluation with a genetic counselor to do a uh, test for something inherited, for example. We mostly, that what, what Dr. Grievous and, and others do is use the testing on the tumor to decide which biomarkers are useful for informing whether you need to have this particular kind of treatment or that one. Uh, and obviously these two things come together really to inform how we use one set of information versus another. And then sometimes there are other risk factors or other things that will come to light from this particular test that will help us guide what, how, what else needs to be done. All right, and obviously we talked a little bit about this, but when you have a genetic mutation or something that could a change in your DNA in the tumor, this is something that's very helpful for which treatment to pick. And then sometimes we identify that this particular change in your DNA is present not only in the tumor, but everywhere else in the body. And that is something you were born with. And that could very well go on to be passed down to the generation forward and probably was inherited from the generation prior. Uh, and if we go and look at uh, bladder cancers and urothelial cancers, it's, I, I, the slide is not meant for you to, to remember all of the details there, but really to share that about you know, one in 10 to two in 10 uh, bladder cancers will have, when we do the genetic testing on the tumor, we'll have something we identify that has a link um, uh, with the genetic makeup you were born with. And I really like the pink chart because it basically tells you that out of the, the, the majority of, of, of urothelial and bladder cancers, most of them are not. They may have changes in the DNA that is useful for picking a treatment, but most often they will not be inherited a change that you would be having this in your makeup that you'd pass down to your family. But sometimes, as you see, the, the, the array of colors, sometimes that's really important to identify because it helps guide whether you need this particular treatment or that one, and then how we help serve and treat your family for early detection or prevention before that happens. And you've heard a lot about this already, so I'm, I won't make too much of a, uh, of a, uh, a point to go into the many details, but as Dr. Grievous just mentioned, there are many, many new drugs now compared to when I trained in medical oncology where we had just this one group of options and the genetic testing really helped drive what kind of medications one can use for what alterations are present in the tumor to really target the ones that makes the most sense and is applicable to your cancer and yourself as a person. So really the, the three here that you've heard about a lot are the immune checkpoint inhibitors for people who have genetic changes in genes for DNA repair. Uh, and there are two different kinds of DNA repair. And the other kind of DNA repair would be uh, something that we would target with PARP inhibitors. And the medications here, I put names, but just so you hear about them, but overall they're a group. And sometimes one will fit better or one will have a clinical trial rather than another. So it's not for you to say, oh, this is the drug I need to have. It's more of a category to keep in mind. And then the, um, the FGFR alterations as a newer uh, um, intervention for bladder cancer that we didn't have many years ago. And the, tech, the take home point really out of all of that is that about 10 to 20% of bladder cancers will have an, un, uh, a, a genetic uh, mutation that is inherited in the family. So we identify it that way. Uh, your medical oncologist or doctor can order biomarker testing to guide which treatment to um, uh, help you know, uh, 
best options for you. Uh, this particular testing may uncover by just doing the testing, uncover something that is an inherited predisposition for you and your family, and then would put a referral in for a genetic counselor, uh, and the genetic counselors are here to help, really, because this information is really difficult to navigate and understand. There are many layers to it. There are many different kinds of testing. And so we're really here to help uh, you understand the information and take it along and help make a decision for which treatment best suits your, your cancer uh, care. Um, and then the testing, obviously, downstream of that can also help identify other things you may be at risk for or your family would want to do, take on for screening for other things they didn't know they had or would be at risk of having to be more proactive and preventative. And I think that's my last slide with uh, the team, the genetic counselors we have here are absolutely wonderful. So do never hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you so much. It, it really is amazing how much this field in bladder cancer has just taken off over the past few years. And I expect each year when we do this talk, there's going to be new exciting updates for it. So, uh, and it has been great. I appreciate the partnership uh, that you offer for us. Well, we're going to uh, circle back and uh, go back to kind of localized treatments of bladder cancer and spend a little bit of time talking about urinary reconstruction uh, at the time of surgery. So the See if we can share it, start this. Here we go. So when the urologist removes your bladder, they obviously have to figure out some way to reconstruct it to drain your urine. And Dr. Sutka kind of highlighted this, just how much of a big operation radical cystectomy is. It has a multiple days in the hospital. There are ups and downs along the way uh, for sure. Uh, but there is light at the end of the tunnel, and we're trying to help you get to that and get back to your normal life. So all the types of urinary reconstruction that we use utilize your own intestines. We don't do a replacement or artificial one from some, uh, some, you know, something else made. We use your own body, your own intestines. And we either use your small bowel or, and or a combination with your large bowel. They all have pros and cons. There's no perfect choice for... For, for all people. Uh, it really is an individual decision that, that people work through with their families, with their physicians and, and, and everything else. So just to briefly show, and I'll highlight these are courtesy of uh, the Beacon and, uh, and one of their, uh, on their webpage. One of the most common is called the ileal conduit. It's called ileal because we use the ileum, a part of your small intestine. We sew the two kidney tubes, the ureters, into a small piece of intestine, usually about a foot long or so, and bring that out to your skin as a stoma. So this is a urostomy. You may have, know people who have colostomies for, for uh, stool. This is the urine drainage. This urine drains continuously to an external appliance or a bag. A second option is called a neobladder, neo meaning new, a, a, a new bladder. Uh, we take more of your intestines in this scenario, typically you know, a couple feet of your intestines to do this. It can be shaped in a couple of different ways. You can see this figure making kind of a W. That is the form that we do here at the University of Washington because we're at UW, so we do the W uh, um, for our neobladder. This hooks up to the urethra, and so the individual will then uh, void their urine out their urethra uh, with it. And then the third option is what's called a continent cutaneous pouch, sometimes called an Indiana pouch. This uses a portion of your large intestine and your small intestine. We sew the two kidneys into an internal reservoir uh, and then bring that which stores urine. And then we bring out a small piece of the intestine to your skin on your belly. And that is catheterized uh, several times a, a day uh, to drain the urine. So as opposed to continuously draining out the urine, uh, this one stores it internally and a catheter catheterization is done to drain the urine. Again, these all have pros and cons. When we compare quality of life and people long-term, overall, there's no difference. In overall quality of life, there are some subtle distinct differences, but uh, people do outstanding with them with any of these. And we have patients that you can talk to and families that have these if you're faced with this in the future. And I thank those of you who have been um, uh, speakers for other patients. So I'm gonna, with that, I'm going to stop sharing 
And I'm going to turn it over now to Zach Annan. So I think Zach is next. Zach is our uh, nurse practitioner who uh, is the lead on our bladder cancer program at the University of Washington. Many of you on here know Zach. Uh, and Zach is going to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, life with a neobladder. Thank you, Dr. Wright. Um, again, my name is Zachary Annan, and I work with the surgical team at the University of Washington and SCCA. A lot of my role is helping people before and after the big radical cystectomy procedure. I see people sometimes at the Bladder Cancer Multidisciplinary Clinic. And a lot of our conversations deal with what is the difference between an ileal conduit and a neobladder and the various different diversion options and how do you make sense of it and what might make most sense for you in your life moving forward. So choosing a urinary diversion topic just or choice, just like Dr. Wright said, it's, it's very individualized and no one option is going to work best for everybody. You know, when people are coming to a decision about what ur urinary diversion top, uh, type they want, a lot of the times they're thinking about how they want their life to be after surgery. You know, we've looked at quality of life indicators for people a year out from surgery, and more or less people have a similar quality of life no matter what urinary diversion choice they make. It's just a little bit different about what those indicators are. So for people who have uh, the, the bag or the ileal conduit, oftentimes they feel like they uh, have a little bit of a simpler recovery period. Um, the, the maintenance of it is a little bit easier. Um, and with the neobladder, uh, patients who have it feel that they have a, maybe a little bit better body image or able to you know, go to the beach or the swimming pool without anybody knowing that they have a urinary diversion. But on the other hand, it's a lot more recovery work, especially up front. There's some rehabilitation that needs to be done to help you urinate a little bit more normally. Um, and it's just a great conversation to have with your clinical team about what might be the best option for you. Um, with the neobladder, you know, uh, I would say one of the biggest differences up front is there is a bit more of a recovery period. Oftentimes at the University of Washington, you're coming to see me for several weeks in a row after you leave the hospital to you know, get some x-rays of the neobladder to make sure it's not leaking, take some tubes out. And then we start the process of learning how to empty the neobladder a little bit more easily. Um, you know, Since it doesn't have the normal bladder muscle that your native bladder has, that kind of squeezes when your brain says it's time to start urinating, it can be a little bit of a challenge to learn those new sensations and how to empty your bladder. One thing I think that makes a lot of sense is if you are thinking early on, maybe when you're meeting with you know, someone like Dr. Grievous about chemotherapy before getting your bladder taken out, it might make sense to talk to your surgical team about a referral to pelvic floor physical therapy to help kind of learn about Kegel exercises and how to uh, isolate those pelvic floor muscles and do some prehabilitation to gain some strength in those pelvic uh, muscles in your in your in the pelvic floor to help with urinary control after surgery. You know, a lot of patients notice that there is some leaking of urine that happens after a neobladder surgery, especially early on. But that can rapidly improve, especially with some rehabilitation and some pelvic floor uh, exercises. Um, another difference. Another thing to consider with a neobladder is occasionally people become some become hypercontinent, which means that you know for a variety of different reasons it's difficult for them to fully empty their neobladder. And if that happens, the reservoir of urine can build up and build up, and they may need to insert a catheter through the urethra. So having the manual dexterity to be able to do that and the you know. Uh, willingness to do that if it's necessary is one of the prerequisites for deciding whether or not you could have a neobladder. Um, let's see here. Neobladders can be a little bit more work down the road in terms of maintenance, you know, and with an ileal conduit, the urine just comes out, you know, uh, there's, it just comes out. Uh, with a neobladder, 
you know, it, you need to make sure that you have really good hydration to help flush everything out to reduce the risk of a stone development or infections. And that's all things that we can talk to you about and help you plan for so that you're set up for success. Um, and that I think is about all I'm going to say on the neobladder side. And then I'm, uh, I think Dr. Wright's going to introduce our next speaker. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Zach, for really giving a sense for what it is and, and, and what survivorship is with it. We're not going to have Colleen Carvin speak. She has been a part of our bladder cancer program since the uh, since its inception. So, and uh, she was for a while the only stomal therapist, urostomy uh, wound nurse, and is now has a whole team working with her now too. So, I will uh, turn it over to her. All right, great. Thank you. So, let me share my screen here. Okay, so I want to talk about um, having your ostomy or ileo conduit and how my team will help you get used to it, you know, understand it before your surgery, help you through the immediate days after surgery with managing your ostomy, and then ongoing, we'll have an ongoing relationship for a really long time. So this is what a stoma looks like. And so a stoma is an opening your mouth. And so your surgeon will bring a piece of your small intestine up to the surface of your skin and you will have a stoma on your skin forever. And people are like, wow, it looks like it's infected. It looks like, you know, it doesn't look good. This is actually a beautiful stoma. It's inside out intestine. It'll be um, red or dark pink. It can bleed slightly when you clean it, but that's not worrisome. And it's um, a little bit moist and shiny like this. A really healthy stoma is what you see here. These are two pictures of urostomy specifically, in case you wonder what was the last one, a urostomy or colostomy or ileostomy, I'm showing you all specifically urostomies. And the one on the left is shortly after surgery, the stents are still in place and those will be in place maybe for up to a week. And the one on um, the right is a well healed, the sutures are gone, everything's healed beautifully like it's supposed to. Now, where will the stoma be on your body? Where will an ostomy go? And I've show, I'm showing you two very different bodies and you might say, okay, which one does my belly look closer to? And the, we're gonna choose a site on the right-hand side most of the time. And we want to look at your belly lying, sitting, standing. We wanna know where you wear your pants. We wanna know where your creases or folds or wrinkles are. So we get the ostomy in the best spot for you so you can manage it easily over time. We don't want it tucked deep in a fold. And when you lay down on an operating table, every spot nearly on your belly is gonna look great for a stoma. That's why we wanna see you before surgery to pick a spot that's gonna look good even and be easy to manage even when um, you're sitting up. So how do you manage the urine? Because as Zach said, urine comes out all the time. So there are one piece pouching systems, meaning the part that sticks to your belly, the wafer and the pouch are already connected. And there are two piece pouching systems where the wafer and the pouch are two separate pieces. And you can expect what you wanna see is clear yellow urine. If your urine's darker than that, maybe you need to be drinking more water. And you're always gonna have little strands of mucus. You don't want clumps of mucus. You want little strands of mucus that helps you also know that you're well hydrated. And your urine output is gonna be constant. Now, if you just drank a big old cup of coffee or something else, you may have more urine output within the next hour. Um, odor, people worry about odor. Odor is, you should only have any odor when you're emptying your pouch or you're changing your pouching system. These pouches are odor proof. And so no one's gonna smell anything unless you spilled urine on your clothes or your pouch, but you will get good at managing it so that that does not happen, at least not very often. And so your ostomy pouches have a spout and you empty that pouch when it's a third to a half full because you start to have the weight in the bulk of it. And you could notice if you let it get really full, it's gonna pooch out a little bit under your clothes. Your ostomy pouches have an anti-reflex feature. So if you're laying down, urine can't get back up and puddle around your stoma. It has little baffles, so to speak, to keep the urine down near the bottom of the bag. And at night, you're, you don't have to get up every couple hours. You connect to your pouch to an overnight bag and you can orient your pouch so it's pointing off to the side. 
at night. This is only if you have a two-piece system, a one-piece system, it's there. You can't move it without completely changing it. But a two-piece system, you can unsnap the pouch, turn it straight out to the side, towards the side of the bed you sleep on most often, then you can lay on your side, your back or the other side without anything getting kinked. And then your, um, your ostomy pouch can drain really nicely overnight and you can just snooze the whole night through. Skin around the stoma is a big deal. And we want the skin around your stoma to be healthy and have no irritation all the time. This stoma right here is brand new, it has a tiny bit of redness around it. That's not a worrisome amount of, of redness. If you were to look at your belly right now and see what does your skin look like on your belly, that's what we want it to look like all the time. And so when you change your pouching system, you're gonna clean your stoma and the surrounding skin with water and a washcloth. You wanna avoid any soaks or cleansers because they can leave a residual on the skin, then your wafer won't stick. You can shower with the pouching system on or off. And then if you have the first sign of irritation, you wanna have a conversation with your ostomy nurse and say, is this normal? This is what I'm doing. What should I be doing differently so we can keep her from getting bad? When you think about diet and fluids, and these are all things we talk about with patients when I first meet them, say they come to our bladder clinic, I meet them, we go first, what are your questions? And I talk through some of these things and we expand on it, you know, over the course of the time they're in the hospital then over the course of their lifetime. So your ostomy has very little effect on diet. Just know if you eat red things, for example, your urine might be a little more red and just can be more noticeable because it's in front of you um, as you're emptying it. And some foods, seafood, asparagus, they cause all of us odor in our urine. It'll just be more noticeable for you as you're emptying your pouching system. And you wanna drink plenty of fluids every day. We could say everyone needs to drink two liters, everyone needs to drink three, but really it depends on, your goal is to keep your urine light in color and the strands of mucus thin, and you know that um, you're getting good hydration. So this is some of my team. There's a few people who are missing, but um, when you meet with an ostomy nurse, my goals for that visit are for you to understand what an ostomy is and what it looks like so you know what to expect. We want to answer your immediate questions about the ostomy to help relieve some of your anxiety, clear up some of the myths or misunderstandings you might have, and to clarify your, your correct understanding. And you, I want you to feel better by the time the visit is over than when I first walk in the room. Most of the time, people aren't super excited to see me the first time they meet me. But truly, me and my team are here to help you with your, uh, have a good quality of life with the urostomy. So initial learning needs, we're gonna teach you how to do it. We're gonna start the first day after surgery. We're gonna teach you how to empty your pouch, how to change it, where to get supplies. We're gonna to talk to you over time about managing your pouch during travel and the activities that you like to do the best. And there are many options and um, manufacturers of pouching systems. We want you to get back to your normal activities soon. And normal might not be what you just did in the last few months because you were not feeling well, but what you used to do and what you enjoy. And there's um, continuing education. The continuing education is available in a variety of places. One thing that's really important is exercise after surgery and not do too much too soon. And so you wanna start slow and gradually build your strength back up. And there is a, one of our, our big manufacturers, um, I don't have any financial affiliation with them, but they have a good program about exercise after surgery and they have a three phase exercise program and you need to get really good and comfortable with each phase before you move on to the next one. So that's something you could look at um, the Convitec Me Plus program is um, the only one that I know of, of any of our big, the only one that I know of that has a really, really kind of a structured um, exercise program. So talk to other people about the idea of having an ostomy, get involved. We had um, Stephanie from BCAN here. There's United Ostomy Association of America. There are runs and walks and World Ostomy Day support groups. There are a lot of different things that can help you get involved, get more educated, and know you're not alone at all with um, having an ostomy. There are ostomy-related products. For example, there's a stealth belt that can hold the pouching system really close to you. There are other brands you can just take a peek at. Support belts, your pouching system is tucked right in that and held close to your body while you're doing you know, exercise or whatever it is you want to do. If you say you're a car mechanic and you're leaning on the edge of a car and you've got an ostomy, there are stoma protectors to keep that stoma from getting damaged. Um, there are types of clothing to help you feel 
you know, beautiful, comfortable, whatever you want to do and cover up your ostomy to the extent that you want to do. So ostomy success, how do you do it? Be active in your care, be active in learning about ostomy and, your, and um, living with an ileo conduit. When you first start having a problem, contact your ostomy nurse, keep in touch with your ostomy nurse and your surgeon, your other doctors for as long as you need to. Build your own support group. When you're ready, let people know you have an ostomy and what it means for you. So if you have a concern, ask us. We really wanna support you in your success with an ostomy. And that's all that I have, thank you. Thank you so much, Colleen. Wonderful talk and so much uh, good information, contents and packets nicely. I think it's important for the audience here to, you know, ask their providers, you know, discuss with you uh, in the clinic if there are uh, particular questions about ostomy. And, you know, I think one of the take home messages that I discuss frequently with our patients is that living with an ostomy is an option and patients can have a great quality of life afterwards. And this is important for education and to help our patients make individualized decision what works best for them on individual level. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Jonathan, Zach and Colin for this great session. And uh, you know, I can tell you, I, keep go I can keep going on all day here. I'm so excited about these amazing talks, all the speakers. Unfortunately, we're on a little bit over time, but uh, that shows how much is going on in the field, right? And how difficult it is to cover everything within you know, uh, a couple of hours or three hours. I would like to thank uh, first and foremost the patients and the caregivers, their loved ones for joining us today. This is your the reason for what we do uh, and uh, uh, what we do every day in clinic and today uh, and for research and education. And uh, I would like to also thank uh, the amazing lineup of speakers today. We heard uh, so many different uh, aspects and uh, so many different experts in the field. So thank you so much for spending the Saturday morning with us. And uh, also big thanks uh, to my co-chair, good friend and colleague, Dr. Jonathan Wright. I cannot tell you how uh, blessed I am to work with him and the rest of the amazing team here, the dream team at uh, our center, UW, SCA, Fred Hatz. And of course, a big thank you to Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, uh, Ritu, Harry, and uh, everyone who worked so hard behind the scenes to make this happen. We could not do it without you. Uh, thank you for all your professionalism and, and, and hard work. Uh, of course, thank you to Howard Cohen, uh, Howard Cohen Foundation, Thank you hard for all you're doing. I cannot express, you know, in enough words, as Jonathan said, you know, our appreciation. And the same goes to Stephanie and the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network. It's just fantastic to work with you, partner with you together, keeping our patients centered in mind. And this is the reason, again, for what we do. I hope I did not forget uh, anybody to, you know, to thank. Uh, it's a group effort here. And again, all the speakers did an amazing job. Feel free to uh, ask further questions, contact us. And please fill out the evaluation forms, the reviews, the feedback we want to improve and improvement comes from useful feedback. So thank you for, for doing that. Uh, and I read to nicely put the feedback link in the chat room here. Uh, we plan to do this again next year, hopefully in person, uh, assuming the pandemic is controlled and hopefully we can interact with you and have even more time for Q&A and interaction. Again, thanks to everybody who contributed so meaningfully and um, uh, looking forward for more advancements and more cures for urinary tract cancers. Thank you. Thank you to everyone.